I'm Cabinet Member in Doncaster Council for Children's Social Care, Equalities and Communities and also Chair of the Board. Um, welcome everybody to this meeting. Um, we've got a really interesting agenda as we always have. Um, four really good items to discuss. Um, I do know that people are here as substitutes, so um, it'd be nice if we can just um, do hello, welcome and introductions. Um, so for people that aren't familiar, if you, when you speak, if you could just push the big red button, um, just say who you are and which organisation you're from. And if you're deputising for somebody, that would be useful as well. Uh, um, I'll start over this side with Rupert and then Dave. Yep, morning, everyone. Rupert Suckling, Director of Public Health at the Council. Morning, I'm Dave Richmond. I'm Chief Executive at St Ledger Homes. Morning, I'm A.L. Slayton. I'm Acting Director of Strategy and Delivery over at the ICB. Morning, I'm Ruth Bruce. I work with the Place Partnership in Doncaster. Good morning, I'm Mandy Espy. I'm the Health and Equalities Lead across Doncaster Place. Morning, Louise Robertson, Public Health Lead at Doncaster Council. Good morning, Councillor Cynthia Ransom, Ward Member for Spotborough. Morning, I'm Glynis Smith, the Councillor for Hatfield. Morning, I'm Rachel Leslie, I'm the Deputy Director of Public Health at the Council. Good morning, Vanessa Powell Hoyle, I'm Public Health Lead at Doncaster Council. Morning, Kelly McKenzie, um, Acting Consultant in Public Health at DBTH um, and also across Ardash and um, DMBC. Exactly. Morning, I'm Nabil al -Sundi. I'm a GP in the north of Doncaster and Place Medical Director for the ICB. Good morning, uh, Martin Owen, Head of Service for Special Needs Transformation, uh, Children, Young People and Families at Doncaster Council. Good morning, Emma Price, Head of Transformation for Starting While at South Yorkshire ICB. Councillor Andrea Robinson, I'm Portfolio Holder for Adult Social Care. Morning, I'm um, Councillor Nigel Ball, Cabinet Member for Public Health, Leisure, Culture and Planning. Phil Holmes, Director of Adults, Health and Wellbeing in the Council. Yeah, good morning. I'm Richard Park. I'm Chief Executive at Doncaster Ambassador or Teaching Hospitals. Good morning. I'm Anthony Fitzgerald. I'm Executive Place Director for Doncaster at uh, the ICB. Jonathan Goodrum from the Governance Team at the Council. Thank you very much. We are expecting a number of people that were substitutes for other people, so um, I can only assume that they may be stuck downstairs. Um, because we had Sheila, Sheila's not here, is she? No, is deputising for Catherine Singh. Camella was deputising for Lucy Robertshaw for the Health and Social Care Forum. And Andrew Bosmans was dep deputising for Steve um, from Health Watch. So they may join us. I'm also aware that some people have to go to meetings, so please do leave um, as you need to. I have to read this out, so we are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber. When you have left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAST beyond the fountain. I would like to inform any members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio-visually recorded. By entering the council chamber, you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. So, on to item two, which is Chair's announcements. Um, uh, been made aware that um, one of our partners within R-Dash, um, oh, Sheila's here now, um, 
Catherine Singh, who has been a member of this board uh, for a number of years, certainly all the time that I've been chairing for the last five years, is going to be retiring from her role as, as Chief Exec of Ardash. Um, and I think we as a board would like to record our thanks for all the work that Catherine has done, um, not just in Doncaster, but we know across the, um, the communities um, in the area that Ardash covers. Um, Catherine, you know, when she could attend the meetings, always made a great contribution. And I personally valued the support that she gave outside the meetings as well. So I'm sure others would like to join me in offering our thanks and uh, a very happy retirement to Catherine, whatever she's choosing to do. Okay, um, also just to mention that I know we have a mixture of board members here and we obviously have some people that are presenting. To remind our presenters that when it says 30 minutes, please just present for about half. Louise is smiling at me and um, because we do like to ask lots of questions so um, and I will try and keep us to time. This meeting is a formal meeting, but that doesn't exclude people who are here um, as observers, asking any questions that they want um, and joining in the conversation. It's great to see so many people from different parts of the NHS, social care and, and wellbeing sector. So if people have a contribution, they have a question or a comment, please feel free to do so and I will bring you in um, at the appropriate time. Okay, so item three is the exclusion of the press and the public. There are no items on today's agenda where the press and public are to be excluded. And then on to item four, which I always think is a really important part of this agenda, is public questions. So this is an opportunity for any members of the public or councillors, elected members that are attending today. Is there anything that they would like to raise in this 15 minute um, Question time. No, I, I can't see any hands, but as I say, as we go through the meeting, please feel, fun, feel, please feel free to contribute. Okay, so on to item five, declarations of interest. If anybody does have any disclosable pecuniary interests or other interests to declare in relation to business on today's agenda, please obtain a form from Jonathan. Welcome. Please come and take a seat. Is it, I know it's Andrew, is it Camilla? Camilla, Carmel, sorry. We knew that we were expecting you. We thought you must have uh, been stuck downstairs. We have done introductions, but if you're happy, just to press the big red button um, and tell us who you are and which organisation you're representing. I'm Carmel Howell. I'm Services Manager from Changing Lives Doncaster, and I'm here to represent Lucy Robertshaw. No replacement. Yes, good morning. My name is Andrew Bosmans. I'm a director of Health Watch Doncaster and I'm here uh, sitting in for uh, Mr Shaw. Thank you very much. I was just saying to everybody that obviously this is a statutory board meeting. Um, we do have board members, um, but equally welcome everybody in the room to contribute, ask questions, make comments um, when I ask for that on the agenda. So please feel free to do that. So we'll move on to item six, which, is, which are minutes of the health and wellbeing meeting held on the 1st of September. Um, they are attached at page one. Um, and has anybody got anything that we think isn't correct that needs amending? Um, if not, I'm suggesting thank you, nods there. So we can approve those and I will sign those as a correct record. So, on to item seven, which is a presentation, by, presentation even by Ailsa Layton, um, who's, going to, who's Acting Director of Strategy and Delivery at South Yorkshire Integrated Care Board. And Ailsa is going to give us a presentation which will outline the up-to-date position with regard to progress in the development of the South Yorkshire Integrated Care Strategy. The papers are included in your agenda at pages 11 to 18. Ailsa will present and then we'll have uh, lots of time for questions after that. Thank you, Ailsa. Thank you and good morning. Thank you. Okay, um, just to give you a heads up as well, I'm actually going to do a little bit of a double act with Rupert because there was a further conversation on the ICP strategy development last night. Um, so he's just going to feed back on that as well. Um, so I am going to try and talk you through where we are in terms of the integrated care 
partnership strategy for South Yorkshire. It is an emerging process and it's moving forward quite fast now, hence we've got some more updates and the presentation this morning that will include information you've seen, but potentially include some additional information as well. Okay, so what I'm going to cover very briefly is the national planning context, just to give you that overall sort of scene setting, what's happening across South Yorkshire, a little bit about what we're doing in Doncaster, but this morning's primarily about South Yorkshire, and then the next steps as well. So in terms of the national context, we are required to develop an integrated care partnership strategy. So from our perspective, that's around integrated care across the South Yorkshire footprint. There's a requirement that we do so and that we publish that strategy during December this year. That's quite a quick turnaround to do a strategy, but that's the, the national direction. And I think the thinking is we need to be able to be clear quite quickly what we're trying to do in terms of coming together across that broader footprint and what that really offers us. As an integrated care board, we are also required um, to produce a five-year joint forward plan. That needs to be um, put in place and again agreed by the end of March. And I'll come on to explain a little bit about the differences between these different plans because I'm aware there's kind of lots of plans that we need to do, but it's just that context. And finally, we will also, as an ICB, doing um, be doing two-year operational plans as well. The time frame for that hasn't been set out, but it's highly likely that we'll get guidance um, before Christmas, and again, we'll be expected to do those plans by the end of March at the latest. So just in terms of trying to set that out a little bit more clearly for you, in terms of the purposes of each of those documents, the ICP strategy is the aim of that is to set out that strategic intention and very clearly try and draw out the benefits of working at a South Yorkshire level. That will be the primary function in terms of what, what we're doing. The guidance is conscious even that the time scale for doing this is really short. So the ICB came together in July and we're looking to be publishing a, a strategy by the end of December. It's recognised that because the time scales are quite short, we, we're definitely not starting from scratch. We're building on what we've got. But also, this is at a point in time. It won't be set in stone in that we'll never revisit it again. It's expected that we will continue to develop our thinking. And certainly, every time any joint strategic needs assessments are re-looked at, so those pieces of work that really set out what's important to our population, we will need to re-look at our strategy. So this is a starting point for us across South Yorkshire. In terms of the five-year forward plan, that will um, get into more detail and define the way in which health and social care will respond to the appropriate elements in that ICP strategy. So it will set out some more of the detail. And across Doncaster, we are also doing a piece of work to look at all the plans that we've got across health and care and how we can bring that together in a way that helps again explain how we're going to respond to the needs, links to the local health and wellbeing strategy, but tries to help with some of the navigation, bearing in mind I've already just talked about a number of plans that we're going to do. We'll try and do that one plan so we have that clarity right across from South Yorkshire down to Doncaster, then even focusing in on health and care particularly, what is it we're going to do and what do we expect to deliver on? So that's how we're trying to frame it so in Doncaster we can get a clear sense of what this means for us. In terms of the ask, so the ask particularly around the strategy, there are a number of things that we need to do. We must in that think about our assessed health needs and care needs to understand what we need to do for our populations across South Yorkshire. We do need to have regard to the NHS mandate, so the requirements of the NHS, we do need to think about how we will address those. I've already noted that we'll have to publish this strategy and that's got to be by December. We are expected to consider if we could achieve anything more where it says it's under arrangements under Section 75. That's all around pooling our funding. So thinking bet particularly between health and social care, are there opportunities where we could go further or achieve more by doing so? It's very clear in the requirements that we also need to make sure that as we're, as we're developing this strategy, we engage and we engage really broadly, both with statutory organisations, um, the voluntary sector and our communities, and it's really clear, and this is part of the developing engagement that we've got, and I'll come on to say a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. And again, as I've already said, we do need to make sure that we revise our strategy each time there are updated um, pieces of work around our joint strategic needs assessments. 
So that was the national ask. In terms of South Yorkshire and what we're doing, the development of the strategy is very much being driven by the Integrated Care Partnership. So for people that aren't aware, that's a broader partnership across South Yorkshire and involves a much wider range of colleagues, um, more broadly than just health and social care. Oh, apologies, that's flipped forward. Um, so the ICP are driving the development of the strategy very much. And it's been really clear what the the work that's being done is building on what we've already got. So building on the engagement that we've already had with our partners and with our populations and building on existing strategies and plans. So as I said before, we're not starting from scratch and that's really important. It's also taken into account all the integration work that's already been done. So it's very much a what can we do going forwards, um, building on what we already know. There's been two meetings of the ICP so far um, to start to do this work. And again, the, the first meeting in September really focused on what have we already achieved, what have we got, and what do we understand about our health and social care needs across the patch. The second meeting, which was only a couple of weeks ago, started to get into how, what do we want to see in the strategy then, how does that start to um, develop, and what do we need to consider. So I've already noted that engagement is absolutely fundamental to what's being done around the development of the strategy. And there are two phases to this. The first phase has been a significant piece of work looking at what we already know. So what pieces of engagement have we already done? Um, and what have we heard from our citizens in the last couple of years? It's a huge piece of work, but there's some really clear messages coming out of that. The second phase is now about going out really broadly to ask people about what matters to them about their health and well-being. There's a short video that's been produced, so that starts to say these are the key messages that are coming out and people are then asked to contribute. And there are a number of ways in which people can contribute. That work's underway now. Um, and again, it's expected that will be drawn together later on, I think, sort of once we're into end of November, December time, to see what our populations are telling us are really important. And are we getting the right things out of our emerging strategy? In terms of emerging vision, the way this has been developed so far, so this has been particularly through the ICP meetings that have been held, and there is a supporting um, group that's doing some of the development work as well underneath it. Um, and at one of the sessions, some, there was a discussion around what the vision should look like. For those of you that sort of pick up on the slide, at the moment there are a lot of visions in there because it's about starting to refine what that looks like, so it's been developed through group work. But there are some real common themes that are coming out already. And that's very much around empowering our local residents to be able to live happily and have healthy lives and thinking about life stages. So all the way through from the best start for children through to living well and through to aging well. And there's a real focus in there about enabling our population to thrive. So although this isn't summed up yet in terms of one vision, this, there's some very strong messages coming from um, those conversations so far. I'm now just going to hand over to Rupert for the next couple of slides because although we've got some information in terms of thinking around shared outcomes, ambitions and enablers, all of that's starting to evolve further from the conversation last night. Thanks, Elsa. And I suppose it's worth reminding people that uh, as a health and wellbeing board, we nominated five people to be on the ICP. So there's myself, uh, Rachel's uh, a member, Nidge is a member, Dolly Aguru is a member and Damien Allen's a member. So if you don't like what you're seeing, you can always uh, ask to <laughs> put yourselves forward to replace all of us. The, the, in terms of the vision, the, uh, the, the one that I sort of noticed is uh, the Mayor's vision for South Yorkshire is in there, which is to be the healthiest region in um, South Yorkshire. So as Elsa said, there are a number of ex existing visions that uh, exist. There are also a number of sort of shared Currently, these are called outcomes, but much more likely, I think, to be sort of goals or um, areas that come out of all the health and well-being strategies. So those five bulleted areas, the best start in life, people living longer and healthier, improving both mental and physical health, supporting people to live safe and equipping people. They're the common areas in the Doncaster, Barnsley, Rotherham and Sheffield health and well-being strategies. And that's where we've started to do... Um, the work. Where we think we've got more work to do, and this was the main conversation last night, is the risk of <coughs> identifying those five areas as the things that we want to focus on is the strategy becomes 
a list of everything that we're doing um, at both at place level and at South Yorkshire level. And uh, we were really clear, and we've been really clear in the ICP that if the strategy is going to really help, it just needs to focus on a few things to add value on top of what we're doing. So the um, analyst uh, community has been asked to look across those outcomes around which are the or those sort of areas of uh, work. Where are the three or four key outcome metrics that we could get behind in thinking about a turn the curve uh, approach, but also wanting to map across these five um, areas at the bottom. So in the conversations that we've had around the ICP and also what we might need to do at a South Yorkshire level, these five things have come up as things that we could do more of. So prevention early detection um, on one side, workforce is going to be a key uh, approach, but also thinking about quality effectiveness, economic inclusion and sustainability. And I think the challenge of the strategy is to identify what those, is to be clear about what those sort of five goals at the top are, what the three or four curves we want to turn, and then what are the, you know, are we clear about what the five areas are and what within those we're going to, to do? And I think that's the question for us today, really, as a board from what we know about Doncaster and what we know about what we might be able to do at the South Yorkshire level. Are those sort of five bullets, are they, you know, are we happy with them? Do they reflect what we're already trying to do as a health and, and wellbeing board? But more importantly, are those five areas at the bottom the right areas that we think we would want to see or we think we've got more chance of doing something across um, um, South Yorkshire. And, you know, I know quality and effectiveness, we'll probably have a good conversation about that in a few minutes because I don't think we'd be saying, oh, that only happens at South Yorkshire level. We're going to have to understand that and have a grip of that locally. It'd be interesting to get people's views on that. So that's the key um, slide for me. The second thing to say is in the strategy, the sort of emerging strategy, there's a whole set of enablers and partnerships that are being sort of identified. I think there's still work to do on these about whether these really are part of the strategy. If they're important, I think they should be in those, one of those five boxes that we've just talked about. Otherwise, we'll end up with a, just a list of asks. So that's, the, that's where we are. And I suppose in terms of next um, steps, Elsa, what we've talked about last night is a sort of updated version of these sets of slides to be used by health and wellbeing boards and by organisations to get feedback and views on, but it is on a very sort of tight um, time scale. Back to you. Thanks, Rupert. Okay, in terms of next steps, I think the other bit's just to flag up, so as well as the um, updated set of slides as R Rupert's just described. Apologies. Um, there's further engagement work that we want to do, particularly thinking about getting out and talking to our population, so that's underway, both in terms of sharing the <coughs> information and asking the questions sort of in terms of in a broad sense, but actually really thinking about targeting some of our communities and going, and going out and having those conversations, and that's starting now. There will also be a webinar during November with key stakeholders to start to try and pull together thoughts again, making sure we're getting feedback from everybody. And I noted before that there's an ICP working group and the expectation is that the strategy actual document starts to get drafted um, and that there's something that will be ready to take to the next ICP meeting on the 28th of November. We're expecting then to do some further engagement with stakeholders on that actual draft document in December and the final strategy will go to the ICP meeting on the 20th of December. So that's really quite a quick turnaround in terms of from an emerging strategy to engage with people as to whether that's right and then get the final strategy right. But as we said before, we're not expecting this to be the final, final step in that the strategy will be something we need to use, we need to make sure we've got it right, but we'll be able to continue revisiting it um, so it won't be set in stone forever. Just very last point on the bottom, that's where I've noted that as soon as we're kind of landing it in terms of the strategy, 
we'll be doing the work around the joint forward plan that will be absolutely key for us because that will set out in more detail then what does that mean and some more specific things in terms of so we've said what's important to us we've said what those goals might be what are we actually going to do to help us achieve those goals so just to end in terms of questions for this morning it's really think really getting a feel from people in terms of with what we've got so far the emerging feeling the emerging thoughts um apologies I don't, it keeps jumping forward, so I do apologise. Um, do we think we've got that right? Uh, the shared outcomes and areas have obviously changed from the discussion last night, so we're thinking more about goals. Do they feel right? And then how do we make sure that we get the engagement right, both in terms of thinking of our residents, but also about all the organisations we have across um, Doncaster? What do we need to make sure we do so that people have an opportunity to input into this strategy as it develops? Okay. Thank you very much. Would it be useful to put that slide back up in terms of the one you said, Rupert, you thought was the, the key one, just so people can remind themselves? That one, yeah. Is that okay? Okay, so really keen to hear people's views. <coughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm not going to directly address those questions, but I just want to maybe try and make a bit of a connection just... <coughs> <clears throat> ask a rhetorical question maybe and then um, pick up another couple of bits. So the timescales aren't great for us, are they, as, as Doncaster, because we, we've got to try and do something by December, which is understandable perhaps for, for, for some audiences, but we're only going to be as strong at this as, as we are as a place partnership. Otherwise, we risk being carried along by something that we don't feel like we're, um, that, that reflects us. As, as, as good as the work that people that Rupert's listed who are representing us will do, so I suppose my question would be, um, how do we make sure this adds value to what we're trying to do here rather than turns into the thing we are accountable to that might miss out on some of our local factors? And then the other question I wanted to ask is, in terms of what we articulate, our health and wellbeing strategy is up for re being refreshed. And for want of a better phrase, our place plan is up for being refreshed as well. So what can we say about those um, products which will come through next year which if we get those right will make our engagement in future much stronger than it's probably going to be right now thanks phil i think from my perspective i think there's we i'm conscious i think there's a, a range of pieces of engagement that we're going to want to do so there's something around what we're doing around the very high level from a South Yorkshire perspective what does that look like and what difference can we make at that South Yorkshire level I think then what you've referenced particularly in terms of health and wellbeing strategy and place plan there's something about that's when we get into so what's important in Doncaster if we get that strategy right we should be able to hang out our local plans underneath that we should be able to see the feed through but I think we do need to be really clear with our populations that there's a piece of engagement underway at the moment but there's going to be more to come and we need to make sure we don't confuse them because I'm also conscious that there are other pieces of engagement underway as well for all the right reasons but we don't want our population not being able to understand why we've gone out so many times so I think there's a job for us to be able to be really clear to our population in terms of what we're asking and why and how we're building on the feedback that we've already got so as we get the feedback over the next month um, into the South Yorkshire strategy what can we draw out of that to make sure we also have singing through our own local strategies as well but I think there is a real art to play with this um, in terms of how we can try and get that right because we are doing um, we've got a bit of a linear process in terms of what's set out but it's nationally but it's kind of, it's concurrent because we're having to develop all this almost at the same time okay is that okay Phil yeah I, I just think in terms of engagement our people they don't live in South Yorkshire they don't even live in Doncaster they live in the bit of Hatfield that they live in you know they live in they live in so so from their perspective they will be thinking how will this add value to my life so that so that in, that's the same as when we engage in on our place work it's it's a, we need to have a very local approach don't we so so uh, that's why I made the point about added value earlier I think you've got Richard yeah, thank you, Elsa. Um, I think I recognise absolutely the shared outcomes because I think there have been shared outcomes in all of the work that we've done while ever I've been on uh, this board. So I think there isn't um, a lack of ambition in terms of those. So I suppose the, the real question is, is 
when we describe outcomes, what do we sort of really mean in the short, the medium and the long term? Because a lot of this is um, longer term benefits from shorter term actions. And the reality is, is we're in a particularly difficult fiscal position nationally and that's going to play out in the next year or two, isn't it? And so um, the next step of setting those short term ambitions that actually demonstrate to people that we're making progress, I suspect will be really key because the success breeds success doesn't it and we want to build on a confident delivery of you know what i might have known as sort of our breakthrough objectives for year one towards our true north objective which is um making a real difference on those so that was just a point about sort of presentation in terms of ambition the second one is is in terms of south yorkshire there's quite a lot of different approaches to the partnership membership and we've certainly been discussing that at, at our board because um, I think every place has got a slightly different model. And one of the things I think we'll pick up on one of the later presentations about health inequality and equality will play out in some of those, because in the short term, addressing some of those health inequalities will actually play into some of those ambitions, because what I think we're going to hear later is, is that the most disadvantaged of our populations are the ones that have been waiting longest for procedures that will get them back to work or get them up and about or deliver their ambitions. So I think we've got to be mindful of, you know, the representation actually dealing with those short term, medium and long term ambitions, because we could deflect to the long term ambitions, the really things we absolutely want to do and not have the focus on the first year of, uh, of, of this in next steps. Did you want to come back? Yes, just to say, I think that's where the joint forward plan will be absolutely key, because although that's got a five-year time frame, there's an expectation that we're really clear in that in terms of what we do in years one and two particularly. So I think that's the trick for us, that we've got to get that right, and I, I do agree, Richard. Okay, anybody else want to make a comment? Andrea. Yeah, I just want to say it's um, it, it, it's good to hear about this, but um, my my feeling um, speaking to people in the community is that when they hear <clears throat> us talk about ensuring the best start in life for children, they think about maternity services and anybody who's accessed them recently, and um, I've been in that hospital this week, uh, would feel deeply concerned. They, they really would feel deeply concerned for the the pressure that the staff are under, um, and 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 just for the circumstances it being so very 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 difficult and I know this is national but I just think we just need to be careful with our messaging and, and similarly um, you know enabling people to live longer and healthier lives you know the news media was reporting this morning had a brilliant person from Macmillan talking about how um, people are waiting for cancer diagnosis and treatment and and so I think you know whilst our conversations about those shared outcomes might have that you know the kind of focus we've, we've we've had this morning i just feel so strongly that that people or you know that just the ordinary people in doncaster that's what troubles them did you want to come back else or do you want me to take some more questions i think i, th I think my only thought on that is again it's it's how we then get that right in our local work that we're doing and where and our local plans so that we can then start to see that what what we're doing makes sense to our local population yeah thank you i've got nigel anybody else oh quite a few right this might go on so um, nigel first hey cheers thanks that, that's that's a really useful presentation i think i think my concern is if i'm painfully honest is 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 I mean, if you look at some of those shared outcomes, they're really good and they stand out. Um, but supporting people to live in safe, strong and vibrant communities. Um, we know we've got um, issues, in, and this is in, in a very small geographic area, if you want to take it, but we know we've got issues in terms of life expectancy and healthy life expectancy with some of our communities and some of those health inequalities that, that are really strong. So, so we look at, for instance, um, Rosington, compared to Tickle, and, and obviously the, the, the healthy life expectancies and, and the, and the life expectancies of those two. In the same way, we look at Fullwood, Fullwood to Burngreave, in fairness. And to me, the, the, the proof of the pudding with this is, is action in those communities, those most deprived communities, if I'm fair enough, to actually to bring them up and actually deal with some of those issues. So 
it'd be interesting to see how it's being put in place on the ground and what emphasis and focus is being placed on those communities that need it most. Okay, we, I've got three more people, so are you happy to take the questions then? So I saw Carmel, Cynthia and Sheila. Mine was just a, a small one about the voice of the communities. I just have really concerns, as you said, that all this needs to be in by December. And just, that's a very short time mm -hmm. scale if we're really not using it as a tick box exercise. That, um, so I'd really be looking at that with the BAME community that we have um, a very strong um, community at the centre. That even giving us six weeks to get the information that you would really need as quality as it should be. I'd be having doubts now, even if I was given it on Monday to get that feedback to you, so just to go through uh, that time scale. Okay, Cynthia. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my interest, of course, is the um, consultation um, with the residents, and uh, I accept the fact that there's sort of the disparity between different wards. However, we have got to accept the fact that this is down to personal choice. And if people want to smoke, take drugs and um, overeat or eat uh, fast food every night or what have you, I, I feel that how do you get to that situation where you're trying to say to them, this is bad for you? Because it's really ingrained in them that they, all the family smoke, you know, they don't particularly cook. It, that is the problem, the roots of the problem. Okay, so I've got Sheila, then Rupert, and Glynis will be my last question, just so we can make sure we keep... Um, thanks, Elsa, for the presentation. It, it's been really useful, but I suppose just focusing on this slide, the areas to go further and faster, and whilst it's really important that we have the opportunity to listen to the population we all serve in this room. I think the, um, the key five areas are, are really significant, but I think one of the most important things is this isn't new, um, and you did mention it, Elsa, that what are we doing already? We've got some really, really good stuff going on, and if we listen to everybody in this room, we adhere that. And I think if we start with that in mind um, and then build on that, and I think there's a second thing here about um, who is doing what, because I'm sure we're repeating and duplicating. So if we can really galvanize ourselves to be more efficient in what we do, we may get those better outcomes, as we say, in every area, further and faster. So thanks. Thank you, Sheila. Rupert? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so a few comments on what we've heard so far, but just to sort of disagree a bit with uh, Cynthia, just on the personal choice. We know it's not all about personal choice. There are other things, and I think we also need to keep in mind that, it's, as Lid said, it's not just, though, within Doncaster, within South Yorkshire, actually. South Yorkshire, compared to the rest of the country, <coughs> is, uh, you know, we've got worse health. So even the most affluent place in the Doncaster health is still worse than others and we can't do, I think you probably wouldn't want to say it's personal choice of people living in there to kill necessarily um, so I think we do need to sort of balance that but I suppose on Carmel's point I think we've been really we're trying to say as an ICP that this is the start of a ongoing journey and I think importantly in the next steps bit of the strategy we've got to be saying how are we engaging you know across South Yorkshire and there's actually some work that I've been doing, you know, for Rachel in terms of well, what does engagement look like across Doncaster? Because if we're honest, <coughs> probably not that. You know, we could be better at it uh, locally, and uh, it's uh, easy to say somebody else is not doing it right, but we ought to also look at how we're doing it. I think on some of what Richard's saying, I think we're going to have some of us have got to that age where bifocal glasses are the thing, and uh, we're going to have to look, you know, long into the future aren't we so we've got a 2030 borough strategy but we've got to deal with the, the here and now and trying to sort of navigate that and some of us are going to have roles that are asking us to do both of that we're going to have to do i think in terms of what phil asked about the future health and well-being strategy i think it's fair to say that we've not we've not uh, got where we want to on any of those outcomes 
for those goals and I would think it's highly likely that those would still be goals in our future strategy and we would still adopt a life course approach but I do think our challenge for those bottom five areas to go past is to really ask ourselves over the next few weeks are they the right areas and what is it we need to happen at the South Yorkshire level that we're not already doing so I think there's quite a lot of prevention and early detection work going on in Doncaster already what do we need to do at the South Yorkshire level the one thing that I think would help us most in South York in Doncaster that's not on that is resourcing so you know it's been really clear that you know, there's been stuff in the papers recently hasn't there about areas with the most health need have got the fewest doctors fewest healthcare resources and I think for me that would be something that I would want to really see is if we're going to go faster we've got to resource where, where our need is but and those are the sorts of I think that as we come and do the next sort of set of conversations it'd be interesting to pick up with people how they want to do this in their organisation <coughs> or in their uh, groupings you know how do we get some of, into those nitty gritty because in, in some ways those bottom five areas we've probably written in strategies for the last five years and have they made any difference so I think we've got to ask ourselves the question is what are we going to put in those bottom five things what do we need across South Yorkshire that will really um, change the gear in terms of how we deliver thank you okay I've got Glynis and then Richard um, I, I mean representing one of the most deprived areas I would just like to say it's not about life choices in somewhere like uh, Dunscroft um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that we say all the time we engage and uh, I spent 50 years working with vulnerable groups and to my way of thinking we very rarely engage with the right people we engage with the articulate with the people who understand their needs and quite frankly nowadays negotiating and navigating health if you're not articulate and you don't have skills is extremely difficult so when we say we engage and we consult sometimes I think we're kidding ourselves because the people who we really need to be speaking to we often aren't um, that's it thanks Glenys and Rich yeah it was just to follow up on, a, on, a, on some of the discussion and, and Rupert's example so I think we do have to take that longer term view on the impact on um, services is often dependent upon issues like we're discussing, so deprivation. So what we've seen in maternity services, which is significantly under pressure, is that from the deprived areas, what we have is higher acuity of pregnancy requiring more midwifery support and care and intervention and all the other things. And in those areas, we have higher rates of smoking, which in essence uh, add to the acuity and the dependency of the pregnancy. So down track in terms of the demand for acute health care um, requires up track influence because actually if we can improve the health over time uh, we will take the pressure off the acute services and that means that the staff will be under less pressure to cope with the services and I think we've seen uh, more of that in COVID because we've seen shifts in uh, the way in which uh, people have access services and you're going to hear that later in that people from more affluent areas have accessed elective services in a much more proactive way than people from less affluent areas and as a result they appear in A&E with emergency procedures emergency presentations that you know actually mean that their outcomes will be worse uh, and actually the amount of health resource going into trying to make them fitter and more healthy rises significantly so this is why this complex problem is a balance and we've got to achieve it but we also have got some really good examples where actually getting downstream and going to the deprived areas has a significant impact in our ability to do that the lung health check which was at the ic board is a is a really good example of that uh, doncaster has as everybody will know um, high levels of respiratory disease and respiratory illness including lung cancer and certain in, within Doncaster the major project was driven uh, David Crichton did a lot of work to drive that project and we took the services to the communities the CT scanners went out to the communities and we did CT scans as a 
um, as a health prevention measure, if you like, rather than as a diagnostic measure. What that identified was a significant number of cancers that would not have been detected at that time, would have been detected much later, where actually the output for that outcome for that patient was significantly worse because we were picking up cancers that were curative at that stage, not palliative. And that then allows those people, in essence, to try to you know, live longer. What we also found was we were diagnosing other problems that those people didn't actually and weren't aware of, which allowed us then to treat those problems, which again may well stop the resources being required to deal with chronic illnesses and more acute problems. But the other benefit was that because the people were in a very different uh, position in terms of they'd attended for things, they were in, wanted to influence the health, a significant number of those people went on to smoking cessation and to the quit programs and actually those programs seem to have very high levels of quit compared to people who were accessed via different routes which I think builds on the point is that if we talk to people we probably get the answer we've got now if we engage with people and make it easier for them we might get a different answer and I think the different answer may well mean that later that demand on acute services, those really high cost services. I mean, the acute hospital is very, very expensive to run um, because all acute hospitals are, in time, it's much cheaper to prevent illness than it is to cure it. So actually the strategy is great. What I think we've got to do is work out the short, the medium and the long term and make sure that what we're doing in the short term is going to have the biggest impact that we can possibly make in the medium and the long term, particularly with a, a tight fiscal position. Thanks. And then Phil wanted to come in. Just, just to address the point about engaging with communities, one, one thing we sometimes do as, as offices is we say, I'm sorry, it's a really short time scale. And we do that bit of work. And then in a few months time, there's another bit of work. And I'm sorry, there's a really short time scale, Carmel. I'm really sorry. Actually, it's the same piece of work. So I think it would really help us to think about writing a bit of an engagement book over the next year where we say, right, it's, it, how do we, you know, chapter one, we're working on engagement at the South Yorkshire level. But don't worry, the time scales are tight, but don't worry because we're going to have a deeper conversation about Doncaster in terms of the health and wellbeing strategy, in terms of the place plan, so that people don't see themselves kind of being picked off for individual bits of work, but they see a way of engagement that connects bits of work together and keeps their voice at the centre. So maybe that's a challenge we can give ourselves so that communities experience this in a more positive way. Okay, any other questions before I try and sum up and then ask Rupert and Elsa to respond? No, I can't see anybody. So I think the big thing that came out of there was engagement, not just the short time scales, but the people that we really need to hear the voices of are seldom the person, people that we do. Um, and I think there's a real question there about how we, you know, Glynis's point, Carmel's point, is, is how we really address that. It might be Phil has the answer, but I think we need to be clear to people because we don't want people to feel excluded. Um, I think really interesting in terms of prevention and early detection. And I think if we're gonna do that properly, we're gonna have to change the way we do it now. Um, so I think that's the other thing. Picking up what Rupert said in terms of resources, if we are gonna deliver for Doncaster, we need more resources to, to do it. So there's no point in saying we don't. Yes, as Sheila says, there is, is some inefficiencies and duplication, and we can do our best to iron that out. Um, but, but fundamentally, we, we don't have the resources that we're entitled to or need in Doncaster. So my question is, can that be included in what we send back? Because I think we need an honest conversation. Um, I think this is some of the main, that last question is around opportunity to influence this because a lot of this work has been done before. So I'm keen to hear how everybody in this room has an opportunity to contribute to this strategy. So when we see it coming back out on the 20th of December, then we actually think, ah, I can see that what my organization put in has been reflected somewhat, but nobody expects everything to be in there. But I see this as the, you know, from a health and wellbeing perspective, is we've had these ambitions for a long time and we've not achieved them. So what are we going to do that's very different? Um, one thing I did want to pick up in the language is working closely with the voluntary and community sector. I think we need to be far more ambitious than that. You know, working closely with people, it's got to be moving to co-production because we're never going to change the way we do things. Um, and then the other thing I didn't see in there was happy. 
I think people can live healthier and longer, but if they're not happy, life's actually quite miserable. Um, so I would like to see happy in there somewhere because, you know, or kindness or something, because it often is what keeps people going. So hopefully I've not missed anybody's points out, which they said. So if Ailsa and Rupert can come back on those, is that okay? Shall I go first? So, I mean, that was really helpful. So we will feed that conversation back into the working group. What I expect to see in the next couple of days is an updated version of that slide deck to come out, which I'll send to all members of the Health and Wellbeing Board, and we'll be clear about timing for sort of feedback. I know there's a, a, a separate conversation going on. I think Fran Joel from Health Watch is involved, Andrew, in terms of how that's uh, working. Um, and then we'll just we'll need to do a lot of this outside the board uh, meeting in terms of making sure. But there's, there's definitely a window of opportunity, and Phil and myself are on the on the working group that's <coughs> trying to support this work. So you know, if if, if you want to make sure things get fed back, feedback to Phil and myself as well. But you know, it'd be great if we could see your comments in the final version, and uh, we'll certainly work on happy or kind or something like that. Just thinking as well in terms of, I think somebody made the point in terms of engagement overload. They didn't say that, but that's how I interpret it. But also Phil's suggestion in terms of, you know, I'm thinking we've got the comms and engagement group, haven't we? Is it possible for them to put something out that almost is, is a really simple way of understanding as a resident or as a community group, where can I engage and when? Is that something that could perhaps be picked up within this or is this asking too much? Uh, my initial reaction is probably too much for this piece of work, but that should be an aspiration that we should should do, and it will help us when we're then doing the health, any work on the future health and wellbeing board strategy. But also then helps us to sort of nest in the work that's already happening in localities. So there's a lot of engagement work happening, but equally, as uh, Gwyneth said, there are almost certainly groups that we are not engaging with as well as we could do. So. I think seeing that map is going to be important. I don't know what you think, Phil. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think overall five weeks is going to be too short to get meaningful engagement for this, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. It's, we might as well be honest about that. We should do the best we can with what we've got, but as soon as we can start in the way you've described, Chair, the better we'll be for future work. Anybody else want... Does everybody feel that their, their views have been taken into account? They understand next steps? Yeah, any nod? Yeah, people feel that's okay. Um, so we look forward to the slides coming out, Ailsa and Rupert, and, and almost what our instructions are as organisations about what we do next. I think I'll take the responsibility along with elected members here that we send those out to elected members so they have an opportunity to contribute as well. So it's to all members um, and look at to make sure that we have the widest uh, engagement that we possibly can in the time scales. Okay, thank you, everybody. I've, as usual, I've not kept a time, but I make no apologies because this really is going to be what drives what we do as a health and wellbeing group. So I was really keen that we had that discussion. So we're now going on to our family papers. We're now moving on to agenda item eight which is the update on children and young people's mental health strategy, including the building of resilience in Doncaster. Now, um, this is the update because we had a long discussion at a previous meeting about mental health, the issues that children and young people were having. If people recall, I think this was a really moving presentation that I think it was Lee that presented and really brought it home to us, the struggle that an awful lot of children and young people are having. Um, hence my comment earlier about happiness is something that we need to address. So over to you and look forward to the presentation. Thank you. And absolutely, this is an update um, from our last contribution, which was in March of this year. And just wanted to bring the Chamber up to date with really the work that's happening with the children, young people, mental health strategy, including the resilience model that we've built over the last eight months as well. So a little bit on the journey so far. Um, We've been very, very busy since March of this year, and we've had some key outcomes that have happened since our inception of the strategy in March of 2022. We formed a mental health strategy board, which we talked about last time, which oversaw a lot of the progress that we've done to date, 
It's represented by um, health, social care, the voluntary care sector, and experts by experience from our communities across Doncaster. We worked on four of the main priorities that we talked about from the mental health strategy last time, and we assigned a priority lead to each of those stages that they could work internally with their organisations to ensure that we got the best deliverables from those priorities. From March to July, we looked at the priorities and developed an implementation plan, and we had a range of objectives and milestones that we set ourselves to deliver by October of this year. We began to work on some of the early feedback that we gathered from service and service users and how we could improve the provision of our mental health services in Doncaster. We also spoke to leaders across Doncaster, across our school services, our social care services, and our early help um, services as well, to ensure that we delivered the message that we wanted to get out across Doncaster, and that it meant something to everybody in Doncaster, and everybody could own the message. We commissioned new services, and we undertook all of the legislative responsibilities for that, including bringing new providers into Doncaster and getting them up and running as quickly as possible. Over the summer, we began to review where we were and we looked at our one-year plan. We also looked at the wider Doncaster strategies that are out there at the moment, so the SEND strategy, the early help strategy, and ensuring that we're integrating our model into those strategies. We've talked already this morning about duplication, how we ensure we don't duplicate what's already happening, and we were really keen that we didn't do that. We complemented what was already there and brought providers and professionals into discussions rather than duplicating that model. We built an engagement framework, building on the locality model, as well as developing an old Doncaster model of engagement. So we're looking with our experts by experience, our young advisors, the young commissioners, and our schools to be able to deliver our messages across Doncaster and ensure we've got the continuity of that message at all times. A little bit on our success criteria and where we've got to over the last eight months. Um, we've implemented a, a schedule called cooth.com. It's an organisation that you can find by accessing www.cooth.com. That is a resilience model that we've built for Doncaster and allows children and young people 24-7 access to mental health support 365 days a year. There is some early help resilience articles on there. There are forums where children and young people can anonymously talk to each other about the concerns that they have. They can also talk to trained professionals and counsellors at any point in time. And as you can see, we've already had over a thousand children that have accessed that service since March. We've had a number of children and young people that have reported they've gone back to use the service and are recommending it to their friends within schools. We've delivered the model to all but three of the schools within Doncaster and every school has really engaged with the Cooth model. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to play the video that's there today, but I have added the, added the link there, which is representonthelevel.org.uk. That will show you the package that we delivered to schools and gives a really great peer support model of engagement for children and young people across Doncaster. In the summer, we held two school summits, which provided the opportunity to talk with schools and bring them up to speed on local developments. We discussed how it was feeling from a school's point of view, and we talked about a mental health pledge and how we could get them signed up to be able to support us on our journey with mental health. We've had 68 schools launch a trauma-informed support model, which looks at anti-bullying strategies within their schools, adapting new models of provision, and wraparound support for all of our children and young people. We've also significantly reduced the number of children and young people attending our A&E and emergency care centres for suicidal ideation. And as a representation, in 2020, when we did our first deep dive, we had 71 children and young people that had attended A&E over a six-month period. And in 2022, we had 11 of the children and young people that were attending uh, emergency services. We've commissioned Helios, who is our digital assessment partner for children and young people that require an assessment for ASD or ADHD. And that has significantly brought the weights down from about two and a half years to 15 weeks from referral to assessment. We've been to the Senco network and we've been to our GP target and we've talked about the GDA assessment and how we're going to relaunch the GDA assessment in conjunction with our schools again so that it means something to everybody and everybody gets the best value of support from that. Some work in progress. We have been building a dedicated children and young people's resource team, which is going to be available 24-7 from March of next year. We are really going to be working very, very closely with our RDASH partners, our school services, and our acute service providers to ensure we give the, the right level of care at the right time for our children and young people. 
We've been working with schools and SENCOs to look at the model that's within their provision at the moment and how we can ensure we're giving robust support, looking at the SEND strategy and how we can develop further with the support model that's there, potentially building another level of support services in there and how we have um, a bit of a, a tiered approach to support in our school uh, environment. We've also looked at consultation models and communication models with our schools. And as part of the SEND strategy, we're going to be talking about how we can further assist them. And as I said, making sure we're linking with all of our schools and all of the models and strategies that we've got within Doncaster as well. Still got some work to do. And absolutely, we knew that this would be a journey that we would have to go on for not just one year, but it would be a number of years that we needed to do. We have developed a live feedback channel, or we're in the process of doing that through Microsoft Forms, and we're going to promote that as widely as possible. We're using the Doncaster Talks model to be able to get um, provision out to Doncaster children and young people and their families about the changes that we're making to mental health services and how we can support them further. The With Me and Mind team, that's the mental health support teams that we have within school. I've been working in collaboration with all of our ASD staff, uh, and specifically fo focusing on children that have complex mental health needs and presentations. We're also going to do a package of support and training that will start in January of this year with all of our CAMS workers to identify children and young people that may have a diagnosis of autism but that require further support for mental health as well. We're going to have task and finish groups that will be working to establish um, all of our local workforce criteria and how any, any problems that we may have to develop greater diversity in our provisions for Doncaster. And we continue to gather feedback, not just from our children and young people, but when we meet weekly and monthly with our wider board, we talk about how we are delivering our messages across Doncaster, how we are integrating it with our young advisors and our young people of Doncaster, and that we're re receiving that feedback on a timely manner. We're also going to be developing and raising the approach to public health, offering the support and developing the learning and health offer within schools, how we're delivering that early intervention model and supporting them at the best point of, the, of their journey. We have the mental health support teams wave eight, which will be commencing in February of next year, of which we will have another 15 schools that are signed up to be able to support children and young people at a lower intervention of mental health before they access acute services. And we're going to be establishing a local head teachers forum, making sure that we're delivering the message again through that, through that forum, but also through our Silver local commissioning meetings and delivering the message once that we want to integrate our services and we're getting the right message out at the appropriate time. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, I, I think that theme around coherence, not duplication, is very much um, the way that we're going to move forward with this piece of work. Um, as Emma said, we have now got uh, a single conversation going on through our consultation and through our, our work with young people and with schools and families, which is around early help, mental health, special educational needs in one place so that you can see that work as a, as a single piece of work. Um, and what we know is that going forwards, it's really important that the strategies will reference each other, but actually that there, there's a really clear and cohesive um, plan sitting underneath it which is in the right place so for us um, we, we can see that there, there are some elements of the conversation that we've been having and the plan we've been delivering which will be carried forward through the special educational needs piece of work knowing that we're working through a very forensic and detailed analysis of what our young people are experiencing and the capability and capacity of particularly our, our universal services to be able to deliver on that at the moment. Uh, and when our special education needs strategy is launched in December, it's going to reference exactly how we're going to move some of those things forward, notwithstanding the fact that at each tier of intervention, uh, the paper that we've delivered today um, references uh, some significant changes in, in relation to, to practice. And, and in terms of our the resilience model that Emma's referenced earlier on, you, you can see how the activity that we've described and the impacts we've described in our report fit into a, a graduation of response with, within Doncaster. We, we know that um, those interventions carry on at, at each level, um, but we've been very keen to make sure that we're focusing on the, the impact of universal services, and particularly, I suppose, the areas in the, the orange part of it to make sure that we are ensuring that we are, are delivering 
uh, an increase in expertise in universal services and impact in universal services. So ensuring that our specialist uh, support teams are able to have the maximum impact and uh, the, that thread is very much picked up through the uh, special educational needs strategy where we talk about how we're going to ensure that funding and um, resources are lined up in order to make sure that all of our schools are, are able to intervene at the very earliest point. So for us at the moment, we, we are engaged in a cycle of listening activity, uh, which has been ongoing since we started delivering uh, this strategy. So we, we're meeting very frequently with the, the Youth Council and with the Ladder Group and with our schools and, and with young people and with our families through Doncaster Parent Voice and making sure that we've got an ongoing commentary about the, the impact of our work and the things that we know we need to do next. And you'll see that continuing as planned through October to December as we uh, launch um, the, the, our further consultation through Doncaster Talks, but also as we look at with our partners the impacts uh, of the work that uh, you'll have seen some of in the, in the report. So that will get us to a position by, by January, February, where we're able to really check in regarding the difference that we've made so far and to make sure that we have consulted really clearly about the things that are changing in terms of priorities for our, our children, young people, families and services, so that by the time we get to the end of February, we have a very clear idea about those priorities that we're going to be delivering in, in, in March 23. So we're going through that period of reflection and analysis and then sharpening up the activities um, that are in our strategy, knowing that we want to create uh, a, a sharp and focused piece of work for the next cycle, the second year of our uh, strategy. And we'll obviously, whilst we're doing that, going to be delivering some of the outstanding pieces of work that we know we need to get on to. And those those include some of those things that are referenced at the, at the bottom of this piece, including that work with our schools on culture, which will go hand in hand with the uh, work that's directed through the um, special educational needs and early help uh, strategies. We are, over the course of the next couple of weeks, working uh, with our schools on those things, making sure we've got an up-to-date picture of uh, the things that concern them at the moment, but also um, rehearsing the plan of attack in terms of looking at those um, capability and practice issues that we know we all have to work on to get better at ensuring our services are effective at the very earliest point. So that said, um, we, we intend to uh, return with an update regarding this piece of work in March 23. So you again will be able to review impact and to understand what those priorities look like going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Really comprehensive presentation and it's good to see how much progress has been made. So I'm gonna look to colleagues now who have got questions. Cynthia, did you want to come in first? Uh, yes, please. Firstly, thank you very much um, for the excellent work that you've done, all that you've succeeded in. Um, one of the questions I would like to ask is that you've got the um, waiting list down from two and a half years to 15 weeks. Is that all over the borough? Uh, the reason is, is from a ward point of view, it's something that people will say, um, oh, we've got to wait, and it's a long time, and this sort of thing. If you can say it's 15 weeks, it helps. You know. It is absolutely across the borough. Obviously, some adult, some uh, parents and children and people have opted to stay for a face-to-face -face assessment. So there is an option now for a digital assessment that children and people can access. As long as they qualify for the Helios uh, package, which means there's no safeguarding issues or no reason why they'd need to be seen face to face they could absolutely develop onto that pathway and at the moment the referral to assessment is 15 weeks thank you um, i saw nabil's hand up and then sheila um thanks chair i mean you know we sit on a lot of meetings where everything's sort of from a negative point of view and, and things getting sort of longer waits and that side of things so it's really refreshing and amazing to hear something where you know, we've actually been able to make a real difference. So well done to everyone involved with that. I had um, <clears throat> two, two points or questions, really. So the first one is, it's fantastic that wait for assessment has got down and, you know, the diagnosis will be made. Are we seeing that there's a long wait from that assessment to intervention? 
is are, are the services able to keep up with that sort of increased um, uh, diagnosis rate? And then the second thing was more a more general point. I guess going back to that negative side of things, we've heard a lot on the news for the last week or two about um, cuts to school budgets and the impacts that's going to have. Will that have an impact on the internal school offer around mental health support? And then do our services have to adapt to those cuts? Thank you. I'll pick up on the first point, if that's OK. Um, so absolutely, Nabil, we've been working with all of our support services to make sure that once you've got the diagnosis that you can access the right support at the right time once that's happened. We're also working prior to the assessment pathway to work with all of our um, statutory providers to ensure we're getting a seamless transition before you access an ASD assessment, you go through something called the GDA pathway, and that is a general development assessment. Now, what we're going to be doing more recently is looking at how we can support that assessment as multiple agencies across Doncaster. We're going to be forming MDTs, so actually we can look at that global development assessment that comes through, and we can see whether this is the right package of support for that child that comes through, should they be going through early help, should they be going through all, any of the other services that we have in Doncaster before they access that clinical pathway. And then post-diagnostic, post -diagnostic, we have the Autism Post-Diagnostic Service, which has been formed recently by Doncaster Autism Services. That's a conjunction with Assets and Doncaster Parents Voice that started about six months ago. It holds 12 workshops for children, young people and their families, has been incredibly successful and is currently oversubscribed. So we're looking at how we build as additional teachers into that resource to be able to support post-diagnostic. I'll hand the school's question to Martin. Thank you. And of course, we remain really concerned um, about funding within schools and, and the need to ensure that when colleagues are making decisions about the use of that funding, that it's done so with young people's uh, mental health and well-being at, at its heart. Um, in saying that, we also know that the um, effective use of resources is going to be an increasingly key question to all of us as leaders across the system over the years to come. And so for that reason, um, we are doing a, a, an in-depth uh, analysis of the work that takes place around young people's needs in, in, in Doncaster, working in collaboration with the Department for Education. And through that, what, we, what we're seeing is not just data and trends, but <clears throat> through our review of cases and decision making uh, in our schools we're able to understand exactly where the resources are targeted effectively and where they're not and that references local authority activity as well so we, we we're going through that process but we've already put into the design of of the strategy going forward two things that we think are going to make a significant difference one um, that uh, we're going to ensure that funding gets to young people and families earlier than it does currently, that we don't need an EHCP in order to access funding, and you don't need a diagnosis in order to be able to access strategy so, uh, for, for young people. So the first thing that we're doing through, through that piece of work is ensuring that there's a needs-led process for delegating increased amounts to schools so that schools are, are funded at the right point to meet young people's needs. And hand-in-hand in, hand in that, we're reshaping our specialist support services so that those conversations with schools about what to do and how to do it happen earlier and that that allows effective resource decisions but it also guides the capability of people in schools to be able to meet needs uh, earlier so that that is a, a piece of work that we've consulted on we know that there's a, uh, a clear um, need for, for that right across the system from the perspectives of children young people families school leaders senkos and so we're, we're currently delivering that so we know we're going to increase the ability of schools to intervene earlier which hopefully will allow us to be able to manage some of those other challenges around funding that we're all seeing thanks chair just as well just to reiterate what emma mentioned that doncaster will receive wave eight funding for the mental health trailblazer which is really quite timely what that will do is put more money back into doncaster around resources that are connected within schools around a dedicated mental health support teams that not only sees children and young people and provides casework, but provides advice and guidance to staff within schools. Second point, just to kind of remind ourselves, is that there's incredible commitment from schools within Doncaster. There's a lot of momentum that's been built up around children's wellbeing and mental health that we've seen in the presentation. So whilst there will be challenges around resources, really quite confident for the foundations there in place from schools. Thank you. I've got Sheila and then Rupert. Thank you. And I think this is a really, really good example of strong partners. 
um, because I know at our dash we're work working really closely and effectively in this group and how you talk about it, it's like one single source of truth and you clearly demonstrate and articulate how all partners are working together really laser focused on the plan and so thank you and I think that that's a really really great presentation and really demonstrates how we can do things together collectively I think what might be helpful going forward is to really look at those risks um, because obviously as we're diagnosing and that's what families want um, there is something about there are bottlenecks along the way um, which you've clearly demonstrated that, that we're looking at. But it would be really helpful to understand a little bit more detail ab around those risks um, for families and for partners, so partners can shift those risks quicker. So thank you for that. Rupert. Yeah, no, thanks, Jan. Uh, thanks for sharing that. It was really good to you know, see the strategy being developed and now being sort of, you know, being delivered. Uh, so a couple of points just in terms of even better this. So for next time, you know, so a lot of things in there is about activity and process, interested about outcomes and how young people feel. And it was great when you had the young advisors came and talked us through the strategy and maybe it'd be good to hear from them at a future meeting in terms of how they feel it goes. Uh, and then I suppose just following up from, uh, I think it was uh, Cynthia's point about, you know, differences across Doncaster in terms of localities. We also know in terms of children, don't we, that uh, some groups have got uh, um, you know, exposed to greater risk around mental health. And so things about, um, you know, thinking about how how are the services performing? What are outcomes for different groups of children? So preschool meals, looked after children in particular. You know, and I think as a local authority, you know, uh, many people around the table will be a corporate parent. You know, so interested around that. And then I suppose a final. Uh, comment in the resilience model I'm really interested in what's below the green box and particularly thinking I suppose about the cost of living crisis so you know we've gone from one in four children living in poverty to one in three children living in poverty and it, and just thinking is there anything that we sh should be doing or more we should be doing with you know the children's sort of mental health workforce that you're working with so that they're equipped to support children and families around the cost of living so do they know you know uh, are they equipped to ask about that and do they know how to sort of signpost people to the help we've got in the borough because I suppose one worry is you know we've got a much more efficient system but the numbers of people coming into it are going to be you know they're just going to keep going up unless we do something below that um, that last resilience but it's great to to see and I think it uh, hopefully you just sort of take that in the in the spirit of even better if I just wanted to touch on the question you had about the areas of Doncaster and how we can get that information. When we've built Couth.com, we've built it based on a place model. So I've built it based on the ward level of every Doncaster, not just the locality area. So we can see the information by ward, and I'm more than happy to bring that to the next meeting to give you the information by ward. It also breaks down by ethnicity, but it breaks down by cultural background. We can also look at themes and trends. So we can look at whether or not children and young people in Tick Hill are looking at different um, articles compared to Rosington, etc. And then we can target that approach with our schools when we're going forward in the strategy. I think Lee wants to pick up another question. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Rupert. Absolutely accept it in the spirit of which it was offered. Uh, and really good points and just a couple of things to, to pick up on. In our, one of our priorities, I think priority three, was around a focus around access and better equality for those residents in Doncaster to access mental health support. We know that not enough young black boys access specialist mental health services, around 7% access CAMs. Encouragingly, with the increase of Couth, we've seen 14%. So already we're seeing that twice as many are accessing it. There's still more work to be done in the BAME community, but it feels that we are breaking down some barriers. So that's a useful thing to know. I think the other bit around poverty is really important. Our New Your Families teams, that are the multi-agency teams that are based in communities, what they're seeing is that pretty much a third of all requests for support are around finance, around housing, linked to poverty. That's only going to get more challenging. Uh, so we're making sure that those teams are equipped to recognise that. We're making sure throughout the, the comms that's coming out over the next few months that residents are aware of 
where to go for help, for example. An e-newsletter was sent to all residents in Doncaster highlighting them of the new teams. Since then, we've seen about a 30% increase in families accessing that support. We just need to make sure that those teams are, are equipped with expertise or know where to support families to get that support. I think in year two, absolutely, the how we respond to the challenges caused by the cost of living crisis, it will be an absolute focus for us. Thank you. I can't see any more questions. So, yeah, thank you very much. So we look forward to you coming back in March um, with the young advisors. That would be great. I've just got a couple of questions, actually. In terms of the young advisors, are the children in care group involved as well? We've got a number of different groups. I think we are linked into the Children in Care group. We're also working across um, the South Yorkshire ICB with a company called Chili Pep that are doing an, an organisational support for integrating into children and young people that we may not be able to access on a day-to-day -day basis and are harder to reach groups as well. Okay, I'm just thinking the Children in Care group were at the Corporate Parenting Board last night and were fabulous. So I think we've got a great resource there in Doncaster. And sadly, last night they were telling us about the stigma that they face being in care, which obviously impacts hugely on their mental health. So it'd be great to see them involved. Just to pick up in terms of the, um, you said about the, the, the app and everything. I mean, I'm sure it goes without saying because there's just been so much in the news recently, hasn't there, about unmoderated uh, posts and influence and that leads to sadly um you know the suicide of, of the young girl that was um the inquest we had recently not in doncaster so i'm assuming that that the that chat that you mentioned is quite moderated and if there is that type of post put on then obviously support is provided absolutely so safeguarding is integrant to the the couth website there are moderators that are on there 24 seven and anything cannot be put on there that's inappropriate, even down to inappropriate language, inappropriate words, they are filtered out so they can't be added to it. All of the chats are monitored and if needs be, can be referred on to outside agencies. So if a child and young person was in immediate crisis, we could refer that to local agencies to be able to support that child and young person. Obviously it's anonymous, but usually from the presentation I had from Cooth yesterday, at the point that a child becomes in crisis with Cooth, they've disclosed a lot of personal information which allows them to be able to ask for consent to be able to share that and be able to go a little bit further with the conversation. Okay. And then just my last question is around the publication and the information to, to parents. Obviously brilliant that it's children, but it's as counsellors, I don't think a week goes by when we don't get a request from a parent worried about their child in terms of mental health support. So you said it was a Doncaster Talks publication. Is that like a hard copy rather than social media? There's a couple of things that's happening there. So the Doncaster Talks publication is a survey that we're sending out to ask for um, the experiences of children and young people over the last eight months and whether or not we've made an impact. But also behind the scenes, we're working on an integration of a mental health support website, which will also look at links to things like um, health visiting, school nursing, and how it integrates with Your Life Doncaster and the other models that we've got there as well. So we're exploring that as, long as, as well as the Rotherhive model that they have in Rotherham, which is a really well used mental health website. Um, so there will be something that will physically come out to everybody in Doncaster, and it's certainly in our plans to do. It'll be at the beginning of our next strategy in year two. That's really good to hear. I can't see any more questions, so thank you again. Brilliant to see something so positive, because I think last time you were here, we all quite were worried about the mental health service. And I think clearly what you've managed to do is really impressive. It would be good to see how we can learn lessons across other service areas as well, so that we don't, you know, I think we often have a tendency to do things and forget why it's worked and perhaps sharing that learning is something that you could cover in your March presentation as well. So thank you very much. We are now going to go on to item nine, which is the Doncaster Culture Strategy. And Leanne Hornsby, Assistant Director for Education Skills, Culture and Heritage, is going to present to us the Doncaster Culture Strategy 2030. And in your agenda pack, it's pages 41 to 104. Thanks, Leanne. Sorry, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Mike. Just getting my very quick tech lesson. Um, yeah, so what I, I'm, I'm going to do is to just very quickly go through a, a presentation. What I can tell you, you've seen the strategy, although it goes up to page 104, 
it's not 104 pages so that's that's hopefully uh, welcome it's been a long time coming this and this was about bringing everything that relates to culture in one way or another together under one umbrella strategy i think previously we've done that done that separately so just to kind of take you through really what the what the purpose was originally so the purpose was to take actually all of the discrete policies and to actually sit them in one single cultural strategy so previously we'd got heritage strategies arts and culture strategies we've got a public realm strategy we've got a library strategy and so on so actually it's about redefining what we mean by culture and then obviously with the new iterations of the borough strategy and the development of the economic strategy the education and skills strategy it's about kind of aligning it all together so actually you can see a common a common thread um, across all of them and obviously and quite critically the link directly to health and well-being we know we all know it it's documented it's well researched that fundamentally culture and participation in culture access to culture impacts quite positively on on well-being so it was to be able to recognize that in this overall strategy and then to understand the roles and responsibilities to ensure that we get true engagement and contributions across across Doncaster so it doesn't just become a document that sits on a shelf that doesn't actually live I think it's really important that it lives and then the final point on that is actually it's about promoting culture so that it's not just this thing that people think oh that's a bit highbrow and that's not for me so actually that it's not just about the theatre it's not just about um, you know it's not just about taking you know people who, who if you like are very creative etc it's about all things it's actually about the local crochet group it's about a number of community activities that take place it's about out outreach so it was just kind of doing a little bit of myth busting as well about what culture is so so in terms of what's what's included this is not a comprehensive list i'm not going to read them out but you can actually see basically there's not a lot that's not included in one way or another um and actually you know a couple of surprises in there people don't really always think do they about uh, getting involved in active leisure about being culture but it is because actually it's a, it's a cultural shift, it's a cultural change, the things that you do are, are quite quite important. Um, you know, it is about the creative industries, it is about music, it is about dance, it is about libraries, museums, etc. But it's also about those those groups that I talked before. So essentially, there's a whole range of things um, in there and that is far from a comprehensive list. So then when we start to look at um, some cross-cutting Themes. I think one of the first things that, that came out um, was the kind of the recovery from, from COVID. And actually during COVID, there were some really interesting activities that emerged despite those circumstances. You know, and actually how, how services generally across all of our organisations kind of adapted um, in that regard. So, you know, one example that, that sits within uh, one of my services is the Healthy and Happiness program that's a heritage program but actually very clearly supports people with mental health and well-being but also supports um, you know people who are suffering from dementia and a range of other other kind of conditions just just so that actually it brings it brings a little bit of a culture to life a greater awareness of the offer so actually what what this is about this is about grassroots all the way up this isn't about just the big organizations that deliver it isn't just about the assets and the big buildings it's bigger than than that and actually it's rooted in individual places across across the borough so it's not just about what takes place in the city it's actually what takes place in individual um, individual areas and wards within within Doncaster it's about accessibility so actually the you know during Covid we learned a lot about uh, digital and how we could kind of adapt we also learned a lot about the gaps in digital and actually how we needed to adapt even further um, and then of course obviously there's there's, there's physical um, activity and we've got a number of sp spaces that we can utilize for that parks community centers etc culture plays a significant part in place shaping um, you know you look you look around places and you see lots of artwork and murals now around Doncaster fabulous to see that's about kind of embedding culture into a into a place and starting a conversation there's then the links to the wider interdependency that I've talked about before in particular and with particular relevance to this board around health and well-being funding and commissioning if you've got a place-based <coughs> cultural strategy it opens up a significant window an opportunity in terms of funding 
So actually, one of the very clear reasons why we have not yet been identified as a priority area for culture is because actually we didn't have a place-based cultural strategy. So the Arts Council step up in a slightly different way now. So instead of just looking at funding for individual organisations, they start to look at actually what's the umbrella, what's the umbrella you know, approach by Doncaster and what does that mean and what can we get access to. And then, of course, obviously it's about, about leadership. So who have we spoken to? Lots and lots of people. And again, this is a, a, a short a short kind of um, list. I haven't moved it on. I realise that's me. Um, so obviously residents through Doncaster Talks, but actually a whole series of things that we call kind of uh, think, think groups, which is where people just came and told us what they thought from voluntary sector, from organisations, from uh, you know, residents, etc. So a whole range of people. Um, Obviously, from South Yorkshire, Yorkshire Mayor's Combined Authority, because we want it to knit and stitch within their overall approach to culture as well. National bodies, aside from their significance and their influence, you know, we need the Arts Council on board. We need Historic England on board. We need the National Archives on board, because they will open doors for us. Um, and then, of course, businesses and the cultural economy. I have to tell you that I, um, when I took responsibility for culture, I was absolutely amazed at the sheer volume of cultural organisations that Doncaster has. It's phenomenal. It's very, very cultural rich when you start to map it out, much more than most most other places. Um, and that now what's happening is, is a, a small um, group of individuals who are now turning this strategy into a plan. The strategy will launch officially in January, but actually, unless we live it into a plan and we do stuff, then we don't we don't land it in the way that we we would like. So, the vision for the overall uh, strategy is is, is th this. So Doncaster is a place of places with a varied and vibrant culture. Our communities flourish by expressing their own creativity and connecting through shared experiences of power and meaning. We supported and shaped that with the Arts Council, with the Mayor's Combined Authority and with our own organisations and then we kind of tested it. That's the bit that that kind of gets gets people to, to step up and take, take kind of notice. What that's really saying is actually the power is in the hands of the people who receive it. So in terms of our priorities, so Doncaster's cultural activity is shaped by the voices of the people who live, work, learn and visit our borough. It's not shaped by, by our teams, it's not shaped by individual organisations, it has to be rooted in communities. Doncaster's communities have the skills, investment, infrastructure and connections to sustain powerful shared cultural activity. So wherever residents look, we want them to actually be able to engage in whatever way works for them with culture. Doncaster makes the most of the, of the potential taking part in arts, culture and creative activity has to transform people's health and well-being because it does. We know that. The evidence is there. Um, Doncaster is a home for learning, mentoring and skills development in the arts, culture and creative industries. What's really interesting when you talk to people, I think often people think about culture as being mostly a hobby. And actually that's great and people get involved in that but also culture and creativity can be a means of employment it's fascinating that people don't don't kind of get that necessarily uh, light bulb moment i went out to a school um, at the bridge um, and there was a young man there fantastic at photography we we enabled um, a photographer a local photographer to go in and talk to him and this young man said to this photographer this is great what do you do for your real job and the photographer said this is my real job he said so you're telling me i can do this as a job you know and that that for me is just a great a great kind of leveler and we just need to you know open a few more doors in that in that kind of sense so um and then you've got so doncaster places collaborate at the heart of our cultural activity our local regional national and global partnerships drive development and enhance activity 
So actually we use what's around us as well as what's here um, to help um, help drive our cultural strategy. And then by inspiring creativity and boosting cultural diversity, Doncaster helps to regenerate local economies, attracts visitors and places culture at the heart of its wider economic uh, development strategies. So here's the bit that makes it a little bit more interesting when we talk about bringing a place-based strategy together. Because you start to look at that and suddenly, because we're operating as a place, as Doncaster, there are slightly more than this now, but there are at least 17 significant funding opportunities with national development funding agencies for culture, libraries, arts and heritage that we can access as a place. Um, low to high financial value but all bring significant strategic uh, relationship opportunities with you know, the big, big organisations I talked about before. Total achievable value is between five and eight million pounds to invest within culture in Doncaster. Mostly capital for research and development, but actually place-based development, buildings and service investment. But there is actually also activity, activity budgets as well. And usually you find you go in for a small proposal and then it kind of expands expands out because you're gaining faith within the big the big funders um, funding is essentially split in three categories um, as we we've we kind of looked at it. so there's um, there are things that we have or will apply for there are things that actually are part of a wider uh, leveling up uh, shared prosperity and uh, town deals and then of course there are things that we could or should apply for. So things we've already applied for are to secure Historic England uh, place marker pilots and that's about specific activities in the place. The British Library Business and IP Centre funding um, and then of course there's there's the Arts Council Museum Estate Development Fund around about 700,000. Um, key risks identified and include uh, capacity to deliver to match the funding, duplicated applications, programme management, strategic fit and support. That's why we are establishing a cultural portfolio board, because that brings all of that together. So we're not looking at it in isolation um, or discreetly. And then, of course, obviously, uh, applications integrate with uh, the borough priorities and the education skills. Um, the next steps, I'm, the next steps really are about bringing this to life now. So we've got a strategy is to actually bring it to life as a plan and then actually to show where the, where the delivery of activity is. And I think it's really important that we align with some of the key areas and kind of um, some of the things that are highlighted here about where actually we've got significant impact or actually where we can have significant impact on health and, and well-being. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Leanne. It's nice to, to see all the work that's gone into producing that strategy and see so many people involved in that. Um, and obviously those those significant, 17 significant opportunities is incredible for Doncaster. Um, and I think, again, it's something we need to be proud of in terms of what we've achieved, but also what the potential is going forward. So, questions. I've got Phil. Can't see anybody else, so we'll start with Phil. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. Um, in, it's, it's good to have a culture strategy, and, and as, as Rachel just said, loads of all the work that's gone in is pretty impressive. Just wanted to ask a practical question. So um, I just had a look at the strategy itself, and there's a bit about um, the objective around arts and health, and then, then there's an objective around physical activity. So what's the practical support and action you need from the Health and Wellbeing Board, to, like, as you just said a bit earlier, to turn some of the theory into reality? Okay, forgetting I have to turn my mic on. Um, I think the the key thing now is is actually getting support from the organisations, this board, to actually make it a plan. So actually to develop an actual plan that delivers on the ground. So what will happen is there's a, a core group at the moment that will build a high level plan, and they're in the process of doing that. But then we have to distill that down. So what does that mean, and what does that look like across Doncaster? So supporting that, I think, is the biggest is the biggest thing in engagement from across um, across organisations. Really. Did you have representatives from everybody on every organisation on here already? Some people that might not think that 
culture strategy is something they would engage with? Yeah, we've got quite a broad we've got quite a, a broad engagement at the moment because actually what I'm doing is kind of utilising as well the group that we used for education and skills as well as the one that we're de developing for culture. So actually I think broadly we have, um, but I need to go away I think and just double check that and make sure that, that we've got full representation. I would say that we have. Um, but if anybody, if it's piqued anybody's interest and anybody thinks actually this person would be ideal to be involved in that, then please do let me know because we're always for adding more people to it. Okay, any other <coughs> questions that people have? Uh, Rupert? Yeah, I suppose a uh, question and a comment really. So I think it would be good to just see the, if you're okay to share the list of who's on that for the end, because we probably don't know who's on it for us. So uh, that would be good. Um, it is a shame that Lucy's not here today. Lucy's actually speaking at an event in Sheffield about arts and health. Uh, and I do think we do need to think about how well we're taught, telling our story. I mean, it is good that the the NPOs, the National um, Portfolio Organisations, have secured their, their, sort of, um, their status through the Arts Council, but does feel that we're la lagging a bit behind Rotherham and Barnsley in terms of some of that. So, it, so I think we do need to think about these opportunities, and it probably does need a collective move to secure them. And it's clear from some of the work that Anthony and uh, uh, I have done in terms of some of the locality investment, a lot of that investment is going into, you know, what we could call sort of cultural activities in terms of just gathering people and addressing things like um, loneliness and social isolation. So I think we could be even stronger than we are already, Rachel, in terms of linking the work that we're doing in this board in arts and health into the broader culture. Okay, so how, how can that happen then, Rupert? What would we need to do as a board? Well, I think if we, my initial response would be we need to know who's on that uh, Leanne's culture group. We need to make sure that we've got uh, at least one, if not two, of the board members are on from here, are there, and that, that where we've got arts and uh, health and we've got arts and physical activity we're really clear that we, I think we would be offering to lead those and drive those um, parts of the strategy. There may be other elements that we would think that we'd want to put our hands up for too. Okay, Phil? Yeah, I think Rupert's right, that's the main action. I think it goes back to what you said earlier, Chair, about, that, about the integrated care partnership strategy and you talked about happiness. So if I just talk about adult social care, I know it might sound a bit glib, but we, we spend a lot of money in adult social care investing in what we'd see as life and limb stuff at the point where everyone's driven to the utmost stage of unhappiness, then we will come in and provide life and limb stuff under a banner of austerity. It's a big shift to make, isn't it? Um, but actually, if we invest in happiness, we will have fewer people that will get to the point where life and limb issues, which are often around emotional well-being and mental health that kind of brings through life and limb issues, they're not addressed. So, so I suspect that a lot of what we call, of call as our mainstream statutory um, organisations and services will probably be thinking about how to engage with that agenda and it would be good if that list helped reflect that. Okay, so that's an action and totally agree, Phil. I remember years ago doing some work around prevention and older people and got very much involved um, in the region I was in in terms of uh, health prevention and chatting to GPs who basically were thanking the service that we were delivering because people were not going to see them that often now because instead of worrying about their illnesses, they were going off to um, a class or learning something. Um, and the evidence is all there because, you know, it's like all of us, if we're off sick and we're sat at home, we think about our illnesses. If we're engaging and we're happy and we're involved and people need us, then... The, other, it seems to like pale into insignificance, not for everybody, um, but for a number of people. So I think the more that we can do to support the strategy from a health and wellbeing service perspective, Liam, the better. And as we've said, we've, um, you know, we've championed arts in health for a long time on this board, and it's fantastic that Lucy's talking about it today um, in Sheffield, um, and really keen to see how we can do that even more. Nabil. 
Um, thanks, Chair. Just a quick final point. Um, I think that's really important connection, but also remembering that our staff, you know, have ill health as well, and making that link. So I wonder if we can just draw that into the workforce strategy side of things, actually making sure our staff have access to the arts and health offer as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Is that included in the... There's no reason why it can't be, is there? Because we're not specific about the who. So I think that it could, it could, and it should be. I think it's a really, really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Unless there's any other comments. Um, so one of the, the action there, um, Leanne, is that you're going to send it around the list to Jonathan about who's on now, and then as a as a board, we can make sure we can make sure that our organisations individually, but also as a board, are involved in that. Okay, happy with that, everybody. Happy. See, so I like to get that in again. Um, anyway, we're moving on to our last agenda item, which is item ten, which I suppose is the core of which you know it's. The overriding thing that we're here about as a board to do is to tackle those health inequalities. So really looking forward to this presentation by Mandy um, from the Hospitals Trust and Vanessa from Public Health at the Council, who are going to talk us through um, the measures that have been taken by partners to combat health inequalities. And I believe that you're going to ask us three questions as well, which I'm looking forward to the answers to. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to speak about tackling health inequalities together with partners and communities across Doncaster Place. Um, I'm not sure, some of you will have heard some of this before, so I apologise for that. But just to briefly remind ourselves about the impact of health inequalities, share progress and traction that's gathering across Doncaster Place over the last six, seven months. Um, consider the population intervention triangle and its application to reducing health inequalities and to ask three questions. So just to remind ourselves, so what are health inequalities? They're avoidable and unfair differences in health between different groups of people. The length of time somebody will live in good health will depend on where they're born. It is not their fault. And the cost of living crisis is actually making this worse as we speak. So once you see the data, you can't unsee it. So the impact on life expectancy. So life expectancy for England is 79.4 for men, 83.2 years for women. In Doncaster, it's approximately two years less for both men and women. Of particular note in Doncaster is healthy life expectancy, which is the number of years that somebody is living in good health. For women in deprived areas of Doncaster, it's 56 years. It's the third worst, third worst um, in, nationally. Of other note is people with learning disabilities, men will live 14 years less and women 18 years less. With severe mental illness, people will live 15 to 20 years less. Um, people who are homeless, the average age expectancy is 47 years for men and 43 years for women. And for people from a Gypsy Roma traveller community, average life expectancy is 50 years. Just looking, I think somebody's already mentioned it um, today, about the 10-mile bus ride across Doncaster from the least deprived to the most deprived. Men will live nearly 11 years less and women nearly 8 years less. <laughs> Um, it is worth just mentioning again in terms of that healthy life expectancy. In terms of the most deprived areas, for men, they live um, in poor health for about 18.4 years of their life, and for women, 19.7 years. So what we're recognising is that people um, living in more deprived areas will live shorter lives, and they'll live a third of their lives in poor health. And what we need to recognise then is that massive impact, I think Richard was talking about earlier, on the demand for health and social care during those almost 20 years of living in poor health. We've heard already again today about one in three children across, across Doncaster and in South Yorkshire are living in poverty. Obviously, this is we've had the presentation earlier, this is impacting on their early childhood development, development and their future health and well-being as an adult. Um, and black women are four times more likely to die in pregnancy and labour than their white counterparts. Again, just to remind ourselves that deprivation is a driver for healthcare service demand. So the graph on the left um, is emergency hospital admissions. The most deprived communities are on the right-hand side of the graph, and you can see the increased activity on that side compared to the least deprived areas. The graph on the right, the blue bar, um, blue bars, again, the most deprived areas are on the left-hand side of this graph, but the blue bars are A&E attendances, the orange bars, emergency admissions, 
and then the elective, uh, sorry, the grey bar is elective admission. So you can see from the most deprived areas how high the A&E attendances are and the A&E admissions relative to those living in the least deprived. And then conversely, those living in the least deprived have got higher levels of elective activity, despite their need probably being less. So Bola Awalabi is the Director of Health Inequalities for NHS England and Improvement, and their clear vision is to de deliver exceptional quality health care for all through equitable access, excellent experience and optimal outcomes. They've developed a, what we're calling the Core 20 plus 5 programme. This programme is designed to support ICSs to drive targeted action in key clinical areas. The Core 20 is the most deprived 20% of the population, which for Doncaster is 41.3% of the population. It's approximately 136,000 people. The um, five are five key clinical areas um, for focus. First is maternity and ensuring continuity of care for 75% of women from BAME communities and from those living in the most deprived areas. Continuity of care has been one of those things that's been identified um, that will help the fact that the, the measure before where we recognise that people are more likely to die during pregnancy and labour. Severe mental illness, so ensuring annual health checks for 60% of people living with severe mental illness. Chronic obstructive um, airways disease, so driving the uptake of COVID flu and pneumonia vaccinations to reduce exacerbations and admissions to hospital. Early cancer diagnosis, so aiming for 75% of cases to be diagnosed stage one or two by 2028. And hyper <coughs> hypertension case finding and optimal, optimal lipid management. So those five key areas will all be significantly impacted by smoking cessation. Um, and actually I've been, I've had a couple of meetings this week around smoking and we were, and I think there's a recognition that the targets are not being met across, across South Yorkshire. So whether that's the quit program within the hospitals or whether that's linking into the PCNs, um, that the targets aren't being met. So I th it's one of those areas um, that I think collectively across place, we could do something really, um, more impactful together if we were all to really get get behind the smoking cessation um, plans and, and look at what we could really do. The plus part of Core 20 plus 5 are chosen population groups that are perhaps not necessarily just going to be supported by those five key clinical areas. And, and people in this group would be people perhaps who are experiencing homelessness, people from GRT community, sex workers, um, people who really are, are struggling to be included um, within our services. We had a, a workshop um, in September, which was opened by Rupert, Anthony and Nabil, who were very clear about our strat strategic ambition to tackle health inequalities across Doncaster Place. And in order to do that, that we need to work in partnership. Um, there's lots of strength around the communities in Doncaster and clear evidence of that asset-based strength approach, certainly um, particularly within the local authority. In terms of weaknesses and, to, and where we are, there's sort of there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect between strategic ambition and delivery, um, perhaps a lack of awareness of health and social care staff about the levels of deprivation in Doncaster, the health inequalities and the context in which we're working and making decisions, and also a lack of awareness of health and social care staff in terms of what is really strong in our communities and what's working well. Um, also a bit of a lack of understanding of Team Doncaster, who is Team Doncaster um, and, and what does that mean for people. So in terms of opportunities, there's that real opportunity to connect strategic ambition and delivery, to target the action of our health and social care leaders and staff on reducing health inequalities, to manage our existing health, or sorry, existing workloads with that health inequalities lens and constantly being focused on that core 20 population to build on partner strengths because there's some really great work going on and we've heard this morning around you know the mental health um, work with the kids and you know there's a massive opportunity for us to to join up some of that work i think so to build on partner strengths and again connect, connecting with that core 20 population listening much more to what matters to people rather than is what's the matter with people um, and then to have that massive focus on prevention in terms of threats and what's stopping us moving forward obviously the ongoing um, impact of COVID and staff fatigue, um, operational pressures in health and social care, the access and waiting list times. Performance frameworks don't really allow for the complexity of some of the people that we've got. 
um, within our systems and financial pressures which um, are coming <laughs> faster and stronger, I'm sure. So in terms of what we've been doing over the last seven months, we're going to very much be focused on um, having core 20 plus five and then access and experience and outcomes of healthcare in the middle um, and, and the focus of what the work that we're going to be doing. We spent much time looking at relation, building relationships and trust across providers, whether that's the acute hospitals, the My Family groups, um, complex lives, etc. cetera. Um, and, and this is, this I think is the thing that's really starting to gather a bit of traction and that people are um, working together and looking at where there might be duplication and how we might do things once um, instead of many times. The other really important thing is about connecting with communities, and we've had some of this conversation um, already a bit earlier today. So what, what are we listening? How are we listening to the resident voice, uh, um, linking into the locality working, the personalised care agenda, working with VAD and Health Watch, um, the maternity voices partnership. So there are lots and lots of different groups around that are doing some really quite good work at a hyper-local level. And I think there's lots more to do in this scenario, in this place, but... Um, we, we've definitely got some really good work happening already. We've relaunched the um, business intelligence team and um, had a meeting yesterday where some of the data is starting to come through linking to the core 20 plus five program. Um, and also we've got the community profiles linked to the locality working. So a lot of that information is available, but I'm not sure how much we're actually looking at it and actually using it and um, doing things with it. We've relaunched the clinical reference group, which is chaired by um, Nabil. So we're going to have core 20 plus five as, as a sort of standing agenda item on, uh, on that forum. Um, we've got the links to the ICB and the population health system delivery group and Doncaster are leading on a, an inclusion health program which is being run nationally, linking into Pathway and Groundswell and the King's Fund, um, focusing on gypsy Roma traveler um, communities trying to really push and be involved in the focus on prevention. So we've got the vaccination program. We've done some work with the cancer subgroup, the tobacco alliance, the get Doncaster moving, the frailty pathways, and so some social prescribing work that's going on at the moment with um, the PCNs. And again, what we're trying to do. So if you look at the five cl clinical areas, lots of people will say we're doing things about these five areas, but what we're not always doing is focusing on the core 20. So I think it's about making sure that we are focusing on our most vulnerable communities as we're doing these different pieces of work. The other thing that's emerging is the links that we're developing. And I think somebody mentioned earlier, and uh, Vanessa will talk a bit about this, but we're all wanting to speak to the same people. And the more focused we become on the Core 20, the more that we will be wanting to speak to those same uh, communities and individuals. So how do we do that collectively in a more cohesive way so that actually we are building trust and relationships and sustainable futures with those relationships rather than different people coming at different times. Rupert's three C's, curiosity, compassion and courage. So how are we going to work and do, deliver this work? So we'll make the invisible visible, show relentless kindness and compassion and learn by doing and have courage. So what do we need? We need bold and brave leadership to do things differently. So we know that health inequality has been around for a very long time and actually getting worse, not better. So what we're doing now isn't necessarily working. Listen and act, and that's not just Doncaster, that's obviously um, a national thing. Um, listen and act to what matters to people. Look at all services through a health inequalities lens so that this is almost a piece of uh, the, the thread that goes through all, all of our conversations. Focus on educating staff and communities. Um, focus on action and focus on evaluation to make sure that we can see that where we're making, um, we're putting interventions in that they're making a difference or not. And developing that culturally competent workforce so who are understanding the context in which we're working. I'll just hand over to Vanessa. Thank you. So um, I wanted to highlight the, um, the components of the population intervention triangle and have a, a couple of questions really, the thinking of our, as, as systems leaders, how are we implementing action on the civic, the service and the community interventions? 
and can we have a significant impact because actually l looking through all of those triangles and pay on a on a place-based planning intervention all of them have such a significant impact on health inequalities and how do we think about having local decision making as the heart of the work that we do we often look at the triangle and think of the triangle and the first conversation is about the civic level but actually the first thing I think we should be thinking about is that community level the first conversation and the, the residents being at the heart of everything that we do do you want to pass the slide one day no thank you Thank you. So, um, community-centred approaches, local decision-making. Actually, um, this should be at the heart of every single thing we do. All partners, including communities them themselves, should understand the potential of community-centred contributions to reducing health inequalities. They are such an integral part of the work that we do, and we should recognise that at all, t all times and at all levels. Understanding that actually we've got really strong assets in our communities, really, really strong skills and knowledge, and residents actually have the social networks to be able to make change for themselves, and how do we enable and support them to do that? Thinking about our local community groups and local organisations and helping them build the good blocks uh, for good health and um, ensuring that we're with them on the journey. So as a part of that service approach and that understanding, the next steps on that triangle is the, is the service. So just giving an example of Be Well. Thank you. No, 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 no thank you. So um, Be Well Doncaster is, a, um, is a, a, a service and approach that working very closely with primary care uh, the primary care networks and primary care Doncaster. Um, if you're not aware of the approach, it's a method of where residents can either speak to their GP, healthcare professional, um, a load of uh, community partnerships, um, or can self-refer uh, themselves to a six-week conversation that's a strength-based motivational tool uh, with um, nine um, health and wellbeing coaches that are trained to be able to support people on on behavioural change and that intervention around kind of they've got to be in that kind of next stage so in that contemplation of change but actually so we've actually got really good strong networks now by working with social prescribing and and uh, the well-being um, officers that we've got within within local authority so that next step so when somebody's on a journey and they're making that change actually we've got that pathway of, of of change and that's a, a great example of actually a service approach where a service approach is really really thinking about the community approach first because what they do is they work really really closely with our colleagues um, in, in Well Doncaster in communities team around understanding so rather than a, a resident not having anywhere to go to when they've had that conversation uh, there's peer groups in place and there's uh, community activities in place to support them. And then that building really into that civic approach. And as leaders, we should be considering what we're, what we're doing around our civic approach uh, to ensure that we're reducing health inequalities in, in, and that health in all policies approach. I've gave a couple of examples here of some of the work that we've done um, across with our, um, our partners and also within, uh, within public health and my colleagues within uh, the wider determinants team. So things around active travel, really great example actually where we can use local intelligence and, and really shape. Street play is a great example where actually people and, and families should have opportunities to, to actually get out and about and do activities differently and things around kind of um, Caroline's led a, a, a quite healthily um, on, on gambling and started to look at some of the challenges that we can and trying to reduce gambling and that's a real example of a, of a civic approach that really really feeds into our kind of community-centered approaches our service approach and that that triangle so just wanted us to think about systems leaders and that whole systems change how can we work more effectively around those those three quadrants Final slide um, and ask of the board. So how, how can we redesi redesign the way that we collectively work across place to connect on the strategic ambition with resources and delivery? Uh, as part of the presentation, you know, do you feel like we've missed anything? Who else might want to be involved in this work? Um, how do we focus on prevention to reduce future demand and social care, particularly when operationally services are so stretched? And how do we shift the mindset to embed addressing health inequalities and focusing on the core 20 communities as part of our business as usual? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And I think there was something on the second slide, which is once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Um, and I think that's probably had a huge impact on us. Even if we live with this all the time, I think actually seeing it on a couple of slides about how, uh, how much we've got to do in terms of health inequalities. 
um, as system leaders. So I'm going to look to uh, colleagues now. People have got. So I'll start with Glynis. Right. Um, well, I wanted to say first, I'm sitting here heartbroken that learning disabilities is not in those five um, elements. Uh, I can see severe mental illnesses in there. We, you know, I, I can tell you the numbers of people with a learning disability in Doncaster, and I'd, I, you know, the the facts and figures around access to annual health checks, the numbers that are done, and I, I know it's a huge problem. And just echoing something that Richard said earlier, that the people who do less well are the individuals not with a severe learning disability who are either with parents or possibly in supported living, but the ones who are on the mild learning disability um, area where they're just about managing. And these are the people who access our emergency services unnecessarily and who need as much support as SMI. So, disappointed. Um, I know everybody can't be on there, but we said at the beginning that people with learning disabilities have, you know, a much shorter... Yeah. Um, Can I respond to that now? Yeah, yeah. So, my understanding is that they've put SMI on there in the way that they have. To, to build on the work that's happening with learning disabilities. Right. So it's not that learning disabilities is not... And also it's not that learning disabilities are not important and we won't not necessarily work with those groups. Um, but, but for me, it comes back to uh, it should be good access for all. So yes. we're certainly not... Um, not working with people, we're working with PFG and different groups of, of people. So um, learning disabilities is definitely on our radar. Okay, Nabil. Yeah, can I just come in and, and, and reassure Gwyneth? I've got the list for the core 20 plus five. So the core 20 is the deprivation bit. The five of those ones that Mandy went through. And then there's that plus where there's a list of things that sits under that. So I'll just read that one out. It's off the um, NHS England website. So it, um, it sort of it says plus population groups we'd expect to see identified are ethnic minority communities, inclusion health groups, people with learning disability and autistic people, um, coastal communities, with pockets of deprivation, multi-morbidities, and uh, protected characteristic groups. And then it lists a bunch of uh, inclusion health groups in there. So it's, it's, it's in there, but I guess it's just the fact that it's a good point, actually. We don't forget, we can't forget the plus, because actually core 20 is, I guess, our, some of our day-to-day -day business. Those five groups that have been picked out, actually, we've got to remember that the plus is there for a reason. Okay, I've got Phil. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good presentation to kind of end up on, isn't it? Um, just connected with some of the earlier comments, actually. So I think Nidge was talking about geographical deprivation. Um, so when you're asking about method or what we're going to do, maybe we need to demonstrate some of the work that we've done in geographical communities and bring back some success stories. So we're cited on those, shaping Stainforth wherever else we can describe in terms of our appreciative inquiry. Maybe we need a stronger narrative of the work that's happening and the impact that it's having and how we build on it. That would be helpful. Um, it was also really notable, I thought, I was thinking about it earlier. So um, Andrea mentioned maternity and, and a colleague also mentioned cancer. They're both in the plus five. So we, we haven't got an excuse to do, not to do something about it from an equality perspective. It's just a question for me is about the method. So the bit that I'm most concerned about, Glynis, with um, the SMI and LD thing is, is what we're chasing. So if it's helpful to chase the number of people that get a GP health check. It's not a bad proxy measure, is it? But it's just, if we limit our satisfaction to that, it's not, you know, we need a rounded approach to the health of that population. So we might say that's a foot in the door and it's a good way to connect with primary care colleagues. But the question is, how are we going to improve the outcomes for that population using that as a as a as a signpost on the way rather than the destination? So that that's the bit I'd be most concerned about with the mentally ill aspects and the LD aspects. And I think what will be really good to see again is a method, and, and is 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 population health management. So 
where are the clinicians, and there are some who are massively passionate about cohorts of people that they want to drive some improvements around, and how do we back those clinicians? We're not going to do this everywhere at once. We're, there's no point in us getting all passionate about everything needs to change. We've got to go where the energy and the, and the passion is now, and we've got to start seeing some successes here that we can then amplify. So I think practically for me it would be who, who's up for leading particular pieces of work, clinicians at the front line of this, how do we get behind them and help it happen? That's what I want to see. Uh, thanks, Phil. Did you want to come back, Mandy? Uh, <clears throat> I think... Um, from, certainly from a clinical perspective, I don't know if Nabil um, would want to come in as well. I think it's understand, this, for me, it's how we make sure we're not duplicating. So what's, what's happening at ICB level from those cl five clinical pathways? What does that then translate to in terms of place? In terms of um, the how, I think the most important thing is to look at how we are working as partners across um, place and what does that mean for health? What does it mean for social care? What the culture, you know, culture we've had the conversation. How do we bring all of those things together to, to make a difference here? Um, we're at the beginning, a bit bizarrely. <laughs> the relationships are coming, the traction is gathering. I think to me, when we can have the connection between partners and the connection between the communities, which is a lot of the work that Vanessa's talked about, then actually we can, we can add the the core 25 clinical pathways onto that. Um, the, the biggest challenge, I think, is, is connecting to the communities and finding the people that are not coming forward to have their blood pressure checked or who are not um, coming forward because they, they are not necessarily aware of what early cancer symptoms and signs, might, signs and symptoms might be. Yeah, so myself and Phil, we, we, we've talked about that, that side of things before and, and fully agree. So I think it's, it's, it's building on that sort of localities approach and it's coming, I think, because all clinicians are incredibly stretched at the moment for all the, the things we've talked about. So we may have our personal interest, but it's hard enough sort of getting through the, you know, what must be done. We're struggling with that um, workload. So I think the important thing is trying to make that localities offer, you know, real and, and work in a way that releases us to do some of that. So you can go and say, actually, you know, you've got an interest in this. We want you to try and do some of that with your that specific community in return we can offer you you know x y and z and then have a bit of a differential offer that that mirrors our you know areas of deprivation and areas of um where we've got those communities concentrated into things so so at the moment if we look at sort of the you know for example the community health um offer it's sort of based on where we've got those geographical assets it hasn't really been planned on a needs basis so maybe we start to think about actually we know this area has got um, you know, so I was at, um, at the Population Health Management Board earlier in the week. John Gleek presented um, a new slide I've not seen before, which had um, the number of people in each of the um, LSOAs who are in that bottom 20% deprivation. So we normally see, you know, we know these areas are the, are the highest, but actually I think we had five or six wards where 100% of people are in that bottom 20% of deprivation. So really, if we are planning how we delivered our services, we would have those ones actually, that's where we'd have things localised. So whether, even if we don't have those physical assets, can we start to, to work in a way that brings that resource to those people, um, both the clinicians, but also those non-clinical resources, so we can free, free up those clinicians with an interest, with a passion, to, to work on the, um, the more complex stuff. Thanks, I'll bring Richard and Nidj in. So just, just, I was just thinking about how we're going to answer Nabil's point in terms of how do we free up those resources? I'm looking at Rupert, of course, but <laughs> I'll give you some time. I'll bring Richard in and then Nidge. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it is safe to say that um, there is also quite a lot of, going, of work going on um, at the acute hospital end of, um, you know, of, of care, both sort of locally, regionally and nationally. There's been quite a lot of reporting on some work that Calderdale and Huddersfield did around how do you stratify the waiting list to take into account of other significant factors that had a longer term impact on health rather than how we traditionally may have classified urgency in terms of procedures because the point I made earlier about the fact that some um, areas of our population don't access elective care but access emergency care with poorer outcomes is a factor on the elective waiting list so 
um, um, all trusts, including our own, are looking at the way in which we identify risk and, and urgency of a procedure or a diagnostic or an outpatient to try to make sure that actually the urgency determines the fact that the outcome needs to be as good because it's the outcome that's important. What we need to do is improve the outcomes in the lowest deprivations in the same way we do for the, the people who live in more affluent areas. So there is, always, there is the work going on now. What we need to do is make sure it's a total effort rather than an effort in isolation, which I think is probably one of Mandy's points. Okay, thank you. I've got Mitch. Yeah, well, first of all, just to clarify, I want, I want to thank you for um, the first page there, basically, that, that you know, you, you've, you've set out your stall and said that the length of time people live in good health depends on where they're born. And secondly, it's not their fault, because we know where this is concerned, it's, it's not just about choice, it's about economic determinism to a large degree. Um, you, you can't help where you're born, whether you're born in Denneby or, or whether you're born in Finningley for anything like that. And, and uh, ultimately, it is linked to, to people's ability to afford housing um, and obviously the area that they do live. I think that that, that, that really goes on to my second point to, to a large extent, where, where I think Vanessa's bang on in terms of the, um, the, the community development and the asset-based community development, certainly in some of our areas. And, and, and I can see that that's been extremely strong over the last few years. I think that you know that looks extremely positive, and she mentions those people, particularly with with um, with the well-being program, those people that are already on the journey. You know, that the, the moving down that. But what interests me is those people that have not even started to get on that journey, or even think about that journey, and it, it's how we interact with those people. And I think that that that's that's not just it's not just for the benefit of this room anyway. Um, and, and it's not the, the goal of this room to, to actually do that work. I think it's much wider than that. And, and again, you know, we saw that report, most of us saw that report last night in terms of the, the issues around Armthorpe and, and crime and burglaries. So it, it, to me, it's an old systems approach that's needed in our communities because a lot of these communities have been stripped of industry for obviously sort of like many years and has, has left us with, with the deprivation that we see today. So it's disappointing that the police and the fire brigade are not here today because I think that they could have an input with this because it needs that holistic approach to our communities. So while we can deal with some of this and we can, we can address some of this, there is that, there is that importance of a, an economic injection around those communities as well. So, you know, obviously in terms of health and the, the way we approach that and working together as partners, that, that's all well and good, and I, and I do take that on board, but I think it needs to be much wider than that because, as Rachel said, and she said many times, it's not just about the health side of it, it's about how happy and contented and safe you feel in your community. And we now know that some of, particularly our ex-mining communities, people that live in them now, do not feel safe and contented with those areas. And it's about how we change that vision of those people living in those areas. Thanks, Nigel. I've got Anthony. Shall I have a go at the uh, resources and capacity Please, question? Anthony, your job. Okay, so I think, and the ICB has hung its hat squarely on uh, addressing health inequalities as its raise on raise on debture, and I think it's, I think we've got to quite literally put our money where our mouth is, and I think that's a fundamental change to the way that we've looked at prioritisation and resourcing in in the past. Um, and one thing we're committed to do across the Doncaster place in health and um, obviously including in, including care as well is to look at a financial strategy and, pri and prioritisation that changes the way that we've done it before which is very much individual uh, commissioner and provider resource um, resource conversations and contracting to actually say we've got so much money in Doncaster for health which is around £600 million, pounds, or it was, and, and we actually start with this rather than an afterthought. So there's a lot of words in there, Rachel, but that's the commitment we're going to try and, and take at place. Thanks, Phil. I think there's a, there's a non-financial aspect as well for me, which is um, I think a lot of our clinicians, because of the pressure they're under, there's a bit of a siege mentality. Um, and um, and we tended because we've managed them in sectors 
they've tended to think that the way to do things is to build up capacity around themselves in their sector. So that's a, not a Doncaster thing, that's just a... So I think one of our jobs is to help clinicians frame the questions they want to ask. Because often we, we want to get involved earlier supporting clinicians. Um, and I, I suspect they don't think that. So, so there's something about how we, we giving them permission is not the right phrase, but you know we've seen it in terms of reaching to the local, locality agenda. They don't really know how to engage with it because they think it's some councilly stuff out there in communities. They don't think it's about how can we share a state better, how can we talk about that person and their family in a joined up way earlier, um, and how can we take that person off your hands. So I think we, we've got we've also got to talk to our clinicians and, and build a bit of trust in them. I think collectively so that um, so that it feels more like a, a team Doncaster because I, I suspect for a lot of our clinicians it probably doesn't at the moment thank you, Richard yeah thank you Jay it was just one point in respect to the presentation just to know in that there was reference under the maternity section to continuity of carer I think it's worth the board um, knowing that continuity of care across the country has been mainly suspended due to um, um, maternity workload pressures it's certainly been suspended across the whole of South Yorkshire because it is um, much much more um, dependent upon increased staffing levels what um, South Yorkshire has agreed is that once staffing levels recover to a level where we can actually uh, provide the service then we'll reinstate them but at the moment it's suspended across um, South Yorkshire uh, Okay, thank you, Richard. I can't see any. So I'm just thinking about these questions that were posed. So I think An Anthony's answered in terms of the resources plan. If I'm thinking about two, Anthony, in terms of how do we focus on prevention? I feel I think it's also about attitude as well. Um, and I think three is around shifting that mindset. To answer number one, do people, do, you know, Mandy and Vanessa's questions, do, have we missed anything? And who else should be involved? Is there anything that people think how they'd like to respond to those? So, I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, it's clear that the presentation that we had today was you know, quite high level. And I think, I, I suppose, there is something about you know, how is that ambition and delivery written down? How does it follow through into, you know, we talked about the um, uh, ICP strategy but how does that how do those actions sort of deliver out into uh, joint strategies and then individual organizational strategies so I know uh, where Sheila I know Ardash are working on their clinical strategy so where's inequalities in the clinical strategy um, so I, I think there's if I was a I'm tr so I'm pretty close to this but I think if I was in other board members Position, I'd be saying, well, can, can I have a look under the bonnet a bit in terms of how, how are you coordinating all of this and, and how, um, ha, you know, I suppose Phil used the word sort of method, you know, what's the method of translating the ambition into delivery? And I think almost, you know, for that core 20 plus five, it's being really explicit about how are we doing it for each of those five clinical areas, you know, as Gwyneth is point you know in terms of the inclusion health you know well what are we doing around learning disabilities is not enough to say it's an issue area it's actually well what are we trying to achieve on this so what curve are we trying to to turn so I think you know Mandy sort of set this as we're building traction I think that's our next step is to be able to describe that in much more detail how we're doing that without as Richard pointed out earlier not forgetting that there's a whole set of pragmatic day jobs that are going on but we've got to try and help people to you know lift their eyes to the future on this so that's what I think our next step is give it a fit Phil and if we're being a bit brutal um, we probably not need to be too worried about what we described about earlier as duplication and pathways because if we're being a bit brutal in terms of these inequalities that we're talking about we need to really revisit what pathways are doing don't we so I think it's it's about our responsibility to add value to inequality, you know, across all of this, um, and not to think that maybe a pathway that might be driven a bit by a sense of compliance with the, with a set of outputs that someone's looking for, not to confuse that with genuinely getting to grips with inequality. So I think it's a, it can be quite fundamental in our approach. 
Um, I think there's two points relative, really, from my perspective, to the sort of resource issue, and they relate back to the sort of Rupert's earlier comment about as we move forward, what I think we've got to do is be really, really clear that the proportion of the allocation that comes into the ICS, ICB, is uh, fairly distributed to all of the places, and I think we um, will need to do some work as Doncaster to just make sure that we're comfortable that is the case. Um, and then we can think about how we use them up the resources wisely. So I think there's a piece of work for us to do that's based upon where we were historically pre-COVID, where we are now post-COVID and the deprivation and, and are the resource allocations all correct. And, uh, and I speak more about the health and sort of care resources than I necessarily do social care resources. And then I think there is a realisation that, that as we deal with the backlog issues, um, what we need to do is do that as efficiently and effectively as possible because um, the way in which I think we release resources for this is to be on top of the acute services, reducing the need for acute services, targeting the areas where we can achieve the greatest impact in reducing the need on acute services because they are the expensive bit. So actually what we've got to work out in this um, complex problem is how do you get from A to B? Um, because once you get to B, then actually I think the resources will more than match the demand. What we've got to do is make the shift. And so what we might need to do is think about how we become more effective and efficient to create a fighting fund or a resource fund that allows us to get upstream. Because once you're upstream, I think then actually you, you are where you want to be and you can invest in the things that cumulatively will produce huge benefit to everybody in terms of the things we've talked about because actually if you're in good health reasonable health you know then you you tend to build on that for mental health for happiness to getting out and about for your fitness to making sensible life choices and decisions you know to join in the active workforce and joining your community so it's such an important piece of work the key for us the sort of senior decision makers is how do we create enough resource to be able to make the change yeah i think that's a really good point and i'm People are nodding. Oh, Kath, I've just got. I'll bring in a minute, Kath. I suppose, do we realistically have the opportunity to do that? And if we don't, what 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 do we as system leaders need to do? I think we have. Uh, you, you, you know, I think that's what 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 again what the ICB is um, is about really that we have those collective conversations. I like Richard's idea of fighting fund. You know, that by by, by becoming more efficient and pr productive to really put some. Um, weight behind this. So, in answer to your question, we can through the through the meetings that we're having, through the approach that we're going to take to resource and allocation. Thank you, uh, Kath. Hi. Um, just a couple of things, really, in terms of reinforcing the importance of community in all this, obviously, um, both in prevention, but also I think um, diversity of message and 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 um, link. At an early stage, um, but everybody's individuals, um, and you know who, who the messages come from, um, is often equally important as to the content of the message as well. I think during COVID, there's been a lot of highlighting of uh, misinformation as well as correct information. Um, so there is that sort of circular conversation, and 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 there's also sort of wariness about there's there's lots of messages about not using acute services but then people who actually need them don't want to because they don't necessarily think they've got the, the right symptoms so just being of, aware um, that this is so so complicated um, and all those interdependencies around that which is just mentioned ar around uh, economic issues and as well as uh, sort of personal beliefs all sorts of things integrated in there and so who's getting who are the messages are coming from and just having that choice in the system as well, because not everybody will want the same package of support. Thanks very much, Kath. Uh, Sheila? Thanks, Rachel. Just building on what Rupert said around the strategy, um, tackling inequalities is the foundations of what we're all trying to do, I think. And actually, the, the gathering traction slide starts really quite, is, is a really good slide because it really does pinpoint exactly what we're trying to do and as, as Richard said we can very quickly demonstrate 
what everybody's doing under those headings and bring them together and then really focus down on, we can't do everything, that's just not possible, and within the financial framework that we've got, but what are the things that we can move faster on and make the biggest biggest impact? Because we've been doing health inequalities for a long time, haven't we? But what's different now is that partners will come together and they will make decisions because if they don't, nothing will, will happen. So I think there's definitely something about that traction slide has started to move us forward. What are the key things that we're going to do that are on that traction slide or already doing? So everybody understands where we're at and where we're moving forward. And I, I agree with Richard. It's getting from A to B and quickly. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sheila. I can see uh, Mandy taking down lots of notes of what's been said, so I hope this discussion has been helpful. Um, I've got a couple of things I just wanted to raise. Um, so I suppose, we, I think we really need to see with those priorities, as others, uh, Rupert and Sheila have said, what's actually happening, who's doing what, and really importantly, as an organisation, how you can get involved, how you can make the difference. What does your organisation need to do to be able to input and change? Um, I think really good to see about the cultural competency training, but I think often with that, we tend to focus on some protected characteristics, or which is great. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But thinking about and Nidji's point about your second slide, how are we going to change the culture? Because we all know, you know, we've, we've all either been on the receiving end of people's prejudice or we've worked with service users that have been on the receiving end of people's prejudice in terms of why they're in the situation they're in, why they've got the health inequality they have. So I'm really keen to see how do we get, like it comes back to the, I know I'm obsessed with happiness and kindness, but that's just who I am. Um, it comes back to how do we create a workforce where we don't hear things like, um, oh, well, that's what that, that, that's what that community does. You know, what do you expect from those people? You know, that type of language obviously makes the person feel absolutely dreadful, but equally doesn't do anything to tackle health inequalities. So I'm just almost looking at a Team Doncaster-wide approach um, to the facts. These are the facts. These are what we've got in Doncaster. It's not people's fault. Um, and so how we, can we collectively address that? And I think Nidji's point about the police and fire and other partners, DWP, others, is absolutely crucial in that. Um, you know, because if not, we're, people who are in the worst situations are just going to feel even worse about themselves. So I don't know if there's any thoughts about training and how we're going to get people all thinking on the same page. Um, I've, not, I've not got the answer, but um, I was thinking maybe we need to have a conversation outside with CAF because some of the work the Inclusion and Fairness Forum has done has flagged similar issues, and that is going to go back to Team Doncaster. I think maybe we need to just think about how we um, frame that. There's definitely pockets of good practice that goes on but you're I think you're right it doesn't quite come over as a team Doncaster uh, approach and if Dolly was here Dolly would say that uh, you know she was very um, well I had to call out at the ICP meeting about the use of uh, hard to reach groups as you know hard to reach is a, you know is a I suppose is a um, evidence of a sort of unconscious bias that people have so I think there's probably something that we should all think think about but maybe it's linking it with some of the work the inclusion and fairness forum has done because I think that's found similar um, challenges. I think it's about not being a bystander isn't it if we hear things like that that we all feel empowered to challenge it. Um, so so I've just got a question really about bold and brave leadership because that was you said something that we need we're all leaders in this room what would you both say is the one thing we need to do differently <laughs> I think I think some of it is comes back to finance and resources and um, not doing what we've always done I guess um, I'm coming back to your training. I think that that training 
it feels like an easy thing, but it's not necessarily an easy thing. So we, we need a tiered education plan, um, depending on who who we need to influence, etc. But but it needs to start at the top. So I think it is that it's that leadership at the top then filtering down so that actually this behaviour is not acceptable, you know. Um, and and so I, I, I guess my, my plea would be let's do it together. So let's not expect Ardash to do a training programme and DBTH to do a programme. Let's have one really strong, cohesive message. Um, but we have to, how are we going to free up time for staff to hear it? And I think that that is a, quite a big challenge. So again, that comes back to unless we create the time for people to listen or to learn, we will carry on doing what we've always done, I guess. Okay, thank you. And I'm just thinking, sorry, I'll just bring it, I was thinking that a few years ago, pre-COVID, sadly, we started to do work with cabinet, um, non-execs, because um, your chair was very involved, chair at R Dash. So I'm thinking if we could start with that leadership level in terms of non-execs, cabinet, etc., we're almost saying that we believe in this, this is what we're all going to do. And rather than you doing it individually, we did have a couple of meetings where we all got together, actually, and they worked really well. So it might be a really good way to reinvigorate that approach. So more than happy to work with the chairs that we've worked with before. I'm just going to bring Nabil in. Is that OK, Richard? Yeah, just on that bold leadership side of things, I think building on that, where does that time come from? I think what we can do as leaders is is give permission or air cover for, for actually what do you stop to release that time until there is a new you know, magical workforce that's going to produce all this. We have to stop things to, to do things in a different way. And that means that at some point you're going to be in that meeting where you're asked why, why haven't you done this or why is this bit slipping so you can do that. And really what we need to do as leaders is sort of give permission to people to get on with that, sort of accept that you're going to get some of that criticism, but also not deliver that criticism if it's, you know, if it's being done for the right reasons. Okay, thank you, Rich. So in, in respect to the question, I wonder if there's sort of at least a couple of things that the bold leadership requires. The, the first one would probably be what management speak would describe as risk appetite. So what is our risk appetite, some of these issues and challenges, and whether we are or aren't prepared to deal with them uh, in a way that we've not done previously? Uh, and then the second one would be, what is our um, thoughts and attitudes on how we do manage inequality and equality? Because someone's inequality is another person's equality and vice versa. And my example would be the waiting list management if we add additional factors into the way in which we manage urgency on a waiting list, which is dependent upon things like the deputation indexes and others, then that means that, that people wait longer and different people wait longer than have waited previously. And so for us, I think there's some key decisions on what we think are important components and decision-making tools in some of those decisions. Because unless resources increase to an infinite level, the resources are finite and determine what we can do. So access to scans, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and, and we described this morning that you know we we took a, a risk on the the lung health checks and went with deprived populations because we did the risk appetite and we decided something actually needed to change. And I think that's probably what Ida would have said if I'd have been the size Mandy, uh, from my perspective in terms of what what does bold potentially look like. Yeah, very happy to have a conversation about that as well and how we can incorporate that. Thanks, Rachel. I'm just um, talking about strong leadership and I think there's something about grip and grit. Um, and I absolutely agree with Nabil. What do we stop doing? There is stuff out there we all know that isn't adding any value and is taking up precious time and resource 
And it's really understanding as individual organisations and leaders to make it our business to make sure that we do get our teams to stop doing the stuff that isn't adding value, or else we'll never be able to get to this place where we need to move forward and properly tackle health inequalities. And just quickly in terms of culture as, as well, you, you know, it's really about having an open and honest culture and that kindness and friendliness and respect and civility um, all of that deeply embraces what we're trying to do and without it, it won't happen. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to, Phil? I think we can build a good action out of Sheila's comment about stopping things that add, that add value. So it might be that we could all undertake as, um, in terms of in our organisations, and we're not talking about stopping things that, um, that will affect our population. I don't think that's what Sheila was saying. I think she was talking about maybe some of our processes that don't really help the population but still use up quite a lot of staff time. So maybe we could we could all put our money where our mouth is and feed that in what we're planning to stop doing in our organisations to build a bit of capacity for this work. Sounds a good plan, Rich. Yeah, so, so I, I would add, and uh, myself, uh, Anthony and Jamie, and we were discussing this slightly yesterday, in that um, I think in the way that the new health and social care architecture is designed, we've got a place which is an entity, and it's an entity that is responsible for health and social care and the people we serve and actually as a place we're often doing more than that in, a, in an individual organization so we've got systems and processes in individual organizations that are actually mirrored and matched in five separate organizations at least yeah. if not multiple organizations and actually some of the big and the brave and the bold leadership will be about whether when it's sensible to do so we should do it once and where we've got resources, we should look at the resources as a place, not as an individual organization. And we should use the resources wisely because we've got a massive estate, you know, and after COVID, we've got massive bits of our estate all sitting empty. And, and the reality is, is how do we use those bits of the estates more efficiently? Because in using them efficiently, I suspect that some of the things we, we repeat and we do, you know, we don't need to do. I might, my classic examples are that I think every statutory organisation in Doncaster has got a safeguarding team and they're safeguarding the same people. Um, we've got, you know, five estates teams looking at estates. We've got, you know, I could go on. And so I think some of the things we're going to have to do if we, we have a risk appetite and we think about it is to think very, very differently about what we perceive in place because the reality is we're all public sector organisations spending public money. And we've all got a responsibility to spend the public money wisely. So I think what COVID has potentially given us is the opportunity to stand back and look at what that opportunity might look like and and where we can be effective and efficient and do things very, very differently. We could probably, you know, put that on a risk appetite thing and see whether there's some things we could actually test and see how hard it is to implement and and learn some lessons and where it's not so hard, do it a bit quicker. Um, because I think that's where the opportunity potentially is going to come. Yeah, really like that idea. So I'm just interested, so we're all clear, um, what forum were those discussions going to take place? I think that's through the place committee, really, Rachel. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the best place for it. And we've talked around it a fair bit. We've dipped our toe in the water, um, but it's, it's about getting serious around it. Estates is a, a, a brilliant example of something that we can collectively um, you, you know, do better. We have got some working examples. So, for instance, Rachel, so when I was at this meeting, I'm going to visit the finance team from my trust, which is now based in this building, because this building had an extra space and capacity, and I'd got an old building that needed refurbishing. We're not refurbishing it now. My finance team's based here. And, and I think we've got lots of examples, because what we've got now is finance teams don't need to be based in the hospital, because through two years of COVID, they worked remotely in the main, but where they do need to come back together and come back here, it's not that far to DRI. Um, and so I think we've got lots of potentially little practical things that we can work on, and it may be then practical things that produce, as I described, a fighting fund that allows us to target some really sensible stuff that will make a lot of difference. 
Lovely. So could we ask for that work to go on and then bring back to say the March Health and Wellbeing Board? Is that fair? Health and Wellbeing Board for March, that would be brilliant. And just to say, I think one thing that we're not always very good at at all, and I say this all the time, is that we don't promote the good stuff that we do. Rich has just highlighted there. I wasn't aware that change had happened. Not so I should be I'm not important, but you know what I mean. Um, but in terms of the Be Well stuff, and, and I just want to see how can we do that better? Oh, Rupert's going to give me the answer to my question. Uh, well, it's not the full answer, but I mean, obviously last year we did the first... Uh, annual report didn't we from the health and well-being board so um, we're certainly on an annual basis we should be doing that but uh, equally and Louise I'm sure will be starting to pester people soon but we could do something um, out of each health and well-being board in terms of what we've uh, discussed and, and some of those good news um, stories uh, but it's, it's worth us thinking through those things I think that would be brilliant, just very aware of capacity, but if that's something you and Louise could look at, I think it would be great. And I think it's also a good way to get people um, thinking, well, actually, I've got something to contribute to that. Why don't I link in with X to talk about what I've been doing? So, Mandy, Vanessa, did you get your questions answered? Okay, we've passed, have we? Okay, um, th that brings us to the end of the meeting, except to say, to note for information only, the health protection, minutes of the health protection assurance group, August and October. So I'd just like to thank you for your attendance, for your contribution. I think we've had some really good discussions. I hope everybody's felt that they can contribute, because I really do try and make these boards as inclusive as possible. But please do contact me outside these meetings if you think we can do the things we can do to change things. Our next meeting is the 12th of January at 9 o'clock. Um, Anthony will be in the chair, um, as I'll be on holiday. And I think, as I always do at this November meeting, I'll be the first to wish you all a very happy Christmas <laughs> and have a brilliant new year, because I won't see you all before then. So thank you. Bye.